My name is Ebenezer Amwako Entry, and you are so welcome to this YouTube channel. On this YouTube channel, you are going to get videos that will set you up in your work with God and also with your prayer life. On this channel, you upload videos consistently to make sure that believers are guided to pray and pray and pray. If you are new to this YouTube channel, make sure that you subscribe to the YouTube channel so that when we upload new videos, you can have access to them. And also, if you don't understand anything, kindly send us a message and we will get back to you. Also, make sure that this video you are about to watch, you will like the video, try and comment on it. And when you are blessed by the video, make sure that you share it to someone. Thank you. And I told us the crisis of life is the possibility that you would be done living your life before you discover you were wrong. You would have lived your life and then when you cross to the other side of the divide, then with all the manifestations of God in your life, then the master will say, away from me, you walk out of iniquity. And then you begin to wonder, where did I miss it? This is why again and again, it's important for us to sit down and to look at the scriptures and find out what is the mind of the Father. So when you see a conference like this, Restored Youth Conference, then you know you are dealing with foundational issues. It's not necessarily a revival meeting. It's a meeting where you set the coordinates of truth so that people can realign with God and have the right bearing for their lives. These were the things we were trying to look at yesterday. As we traveled with God until it became a bit explosive. So this morning, I want to add the second layer to the progression of truth so that the course of our lives can be one that has meaning and essence. Everything was created for a definite purpose. And on the strength of that, we began to define what life was. And we say life is not necessarily a breath of God that is on your nostrils. Because even the animals have breath on their nostrils. But the meaning of their lives cannot be compared to ours. And by the help of God, we say life, the essence of life, is the degree to which you give expression to the will of a spirit. Humankind was designed to envelop the will of spirit beings and to communicate it in their context. So a man can live in this world for many years, 90 years, 100 years, would have acquired everything there is to acquire in life. But we say when the scales of immortality are open, it is possible that that man would not have appeared to the radar of heaven. So we said Moses was a prince in Egypt, living in affluence, and nothing was written about Moses. He studied the book of Exodus from the beginning of his birth. Everything that was written was concerning the events that took place around Moses. Nothing about Moses was written. Because so long as the scribes of heaven were concerned, Moses' life would begin to come the day he found Moses. The day he understood how to give expression to the will of God. So the Bible wrote nothing about Moses. He only told us stories about the circumstances that surrounded his birth. Until he said, when Moses was come of age. And the moment Moses was come of age, he went back to the foundation. And he began to change the patterns that defined the direction of his life. He said the first thing he did was that he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. For 40 years, what gave Moses value and credence in Egypt was his association with Pharaoh's daughter. That would have been the most difficult decision to make. But he knew that for his life to come, the first thing to do was to deny his affiliation with the systems of the world. Because so long as he was connected to Pharaoh's daughter, everything he called life and meaning would have been expression to the will of the Leviathan that was in the belly of the Red Sea. So he said, when Moses was come of age, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. They didn't say he denied it. They didn't say he ignored it. He refused because there were possible forces that wanted to hold him back. 
But he refused that privilege. I will not be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And he didn't stop there. The Bible said he chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than the pledges that was in Egypt for the season. And we made it clear yesterday that God is not against pleasure. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17, the Bible said, Tell them that are rich in this world to be not high minded, not trusting on certain riches, but in the living God that giveth to every man liberally that he may enjoy. So God does not abhor proper living. But God is interested in a lifestyle that will give expression to his will. Moses discovered it. And for Moses' case, the only way to fulfill the mandate of God for his life was to affiliate himself back with the people that were in poverty. And I said, these kinds of truth are no longer taught in the body of Christ. So we consider life to be the abundance possession that man can have. So when the path of a man's life wanders through a pathway of suffering, that man will avoid it. Because he thinks the only direction God goes is the direction of plenty. And that is why many are alive for their lives to be. I said it was possible for God to make one a king and to make another a pauper. I said it was possible for God to give another all the security of life and send another to eternity where he will be beheaded. And we say, how can justice be defined with this kind of scale? Myself and my brother will begin set out to serve the Lord and then God makes him an evangelist and then in three months he's known in all the nations. In three years he's, been, he's receiving seeds in six digits. Meanwhile God sentenced me to be an intercessor and in that case I have nothing. How do I rationalize? Both of us applying the principles of prosperity. Both of us serving God in spirit and in truth but certainly his own path leads to affluence and my own path leads to pain. So how do I conclude that God is still a just God? The only way justice can be defined in this context is when we understand that life is giving expression to the will of God. So for you, the only way you can express the will of God is to go through that path. For him, the only way you can express the will of God is to go through affluence. At the end of the day, when they are judged eternity, we will not be judged by what we have. We will be judged by the degree to which that which God wanted to do in our generation was expressed through us. So the Bible said concerning David that when he had served the will of God, he rested with his fathers. God never considered the affluence and the wealth of David. The only thing spirit look at when they judge the quality and the texture of a man's life is the degree to which the will of God was conducted through their everyday living. But unfortunately, this is what is lacking. Every time we come to church, we are loaded with prophecies of prosperity. But our soul is dying. We have no fellowship with God. We have no relationship with God. But our doctrines, our teachings must always end in plenty. And then I began to ask myself, how about Kalosli who has no God? But is one of the wealthiest men in the world. How about Dangote who is a Muslim? That have no regard for the living God, yet the richest black man. In prosperity and abundance is the focus. Then, how do you now explain what you call a blessing? Because the man that has no prophecy over his life, the man that has no blessing over his life, is still making it in this world by sheer hard work and diligence. So, we concluded last night that everything we have and everything we pursue, God is not against it. But everything we have and everything we pursue must be built on the foundation of our relationship with God. Because that is the eternal purpose of God. And if we know this, circumstances can no longer move us. If we know this, our decision making processes can no longer be influenced by circumstances. It will always be influenced by the present revelation position of God. Every time we take a step, it's because God wanted us to take a step. These were the things that the patriarchs of old knew. Abraham was living with his father in the regions of Mesopotamia, in the hall of the Chaldeans. They were doing very well. And all of a sudden, God comes to him and says, Leave your country, leave your kindred, 
leave your father's house and come to the land that I will show you. How can a man walking with Chevron go suddenly hear his spirit and he say, Abandon the job and come? Hope you know that kind of doctrine will no longer pass in the current Christianity that we practice. You are working with sheer. All your allowances are in six digits. And suddenly a spirit appears and says, Leave there and come, I will show you where you will go. Then you go back for three months and you begin to pray. Uh, where is the place? I was working with the bank. They said I should leave. Are you taking me to Chevron? You know, that's how we calculate blessing now from glory to glory. <laughs> I was a banker. Now I'm in Chevron. <laughs> but when we looked at the life of Abraham, when we look at the life of the patriarchs, we understand that life does not travel in the direction of plenty. Life travels in the direction of God. And the moment a man is willing to travel in the direction of God, even the things he seeks will be added to him. But I gave us a condition. I said, on the scale of God, what you have will not be more than the quality of your relationship. The moment your possession is beyond the quality of your relationship with God, you have become a victim of the fall. And man of can easily manipulate you. God does not bless a man with physical possession more than the revelation of him that that man has. I will show you from scripture. In Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22, the Bible said, It is the blessings of God that make it rich and added no sorrow to it. And I told you something. You know, when you are reading, hear what God says in the message, and also hear what God is saying that is not part of the message. It is the blessings of God that make it rich and added no sorrow to it. And I told you quickly that it also means it's not only God that blesses you. The only difference is telling you in that scripture is that when God blesses, you will be rich and you have no sorrow. It also means if it is not God that is blessing, you will still be rich, but your riches will come with sorrow. So there are other spirits in this realm that have the ability to bless. And I took time yesterday to show you the ranking of the spirit. You know, many people come and say, Ah, Satan has no power. Satan fought for water. Water, water. And I asked us one question yesterday. I said, if Satan has no power, how come people are sick? Is it God that made them sick? So if your soul is not calibrated such that you pursue God and God alone, and you begin to pursue riches, it's possible that the blessings you'll be working under will be another economy apart from the economy of God. And the only way you can evaluate it is to judge the quality of your relationship vis-a-vis -vis the quality of your blessing. The moment riches and what you have becomes stronger in your life than the quality of your relationship with God, you have already drifted to the wrong way. Either you have come under the influence of a spirit or you are falling into the second category. Look at what the Bible said about the second category. In the Gospel of Luke chapter 12, from verse 17, see what the Bible says. It spoke about the rich man. The guy had wisdom for wealth creation, nothing wrong with it. The guy had hard work and diligence, nothing wrong with it. He became so rich. He had no room to put all that he had, and he went inside. And that night he was so uh, he was so overjoyed by the wealth he has amassed. And he said, Now his soul can rest. Now see the position of God about such people in verse 20. He said, You fool. He said, What? You fool. So there are two possessions, positions that a man can assume when he's not blessed of God. If his relationship with God is not superior to his blessings, either he comes under the influence of another spirit that is called idolatry, or God calls him a fool. He says, You fool. This is what God said about a man, a man who is prospering. He's not committing any evil. His wealth was by hard work and wisdom. 
But the problem is there was no relationship. How many things have we pursued at the expense of relationship? You know, these are common things in cities like Lagos. The guy comes for prayer meeting, blasting in tongues for seven hours, and you say, God, God has truly arrested Nathaniel. And then Nathaniel was praying in tongues until he entered into a window of favor. And on account of that favor, he gets a job with Chevron. And then Nathaniel appears in prayer meeting once in a year. And then he says, Kai, Nathaniel, what's happening? He says, Boy, you know I love God. You know I love God. Even God knows I love Him. His root was not in God. The prayer power, the motivation, was all about getting it in time, to succeed in time. It was not a pursuer of God. It was a pursuer of things. And the moment things came, things became his God. Jesus calls such people fools. They have no meaning in time. When you come to a territory like this, it's important for you to check and evaluate for them. God will bless all of us. And God is blessing us. There are principles of prosperity. We are all practicing it. But what is the texture of our relationship with God? That's what we define who we are in this world. Because if you come under the influence of the Spirit, you don't know what it has, the capacity a Spirit has over your soul. The influence of a Spirit can alter the direction of your life forever. Many people begin very accurately pursuing God to do what God will have them do. Masters of Scripture. They walk in the presence of God until one came Somebody came to them and said, No, this thing is packaging. There's packaging. There's packaging. There's a way you do this thing. So the guy packages until even when he's under the anointing. Packaging now becomes the flow of the life of God. Even under the anointing, packaging becomes a hindrance to the flow of God. So even the most spiritual things, there is a way a spirit can sneak into your soul. He introduces you to things. And the moment you begin to look at things away from God, the direction of your life changes. Even when you are doing the most spiritual thing, you will no longer have capacity to stand as a man of rank in the spirit. So when we talk about restoration, we are going back to the foundation to recalibrate the quality of our relationship with God. So that the structure of our souls can be reconfigured to be able to mirror the dimensions of God because that's what many of us lack. We may be preaching, we are communicating a different spirit. We may be praying, communicating a different spirit. What then is the issue? There is a cure to the affliction of the soul. The garbage of the soul, there is a cure to it. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. Where your soul is currently standing with God, ascertain the things that motivate your action. If you give you an idea where your soul is, if your operating system is defined by lust, even though you are praying in tongues for 10 hours, you are already gone. Have you seen people that go on retreat for 21 days and when you hear the substance of their prayer? Hmm, That America must go to see. Why are you going to America? He has no connection with God. Have you checked where God wants you to go? He has no idea. <laughs> That's the kind of Christianity we have today. Praying for things without verifying the position of God. James came and he was so blunt. He said, You pray and you receive not because you pray and miss. You pray and you receive not. Because you pray to lavish it on your pleasure, on your desire, on your lust. So even God Himself withhold certain things from people. Because if He gives it to them, they will be destroyed. There is something that every one of us must allow our soul to go through. 
so that even while we are in Babylon, we can be accurate. Even while we are in Egypt, we can be accurate. There is something that must happen to our soul. It is called the sanctifying power of the Holy Ghost. Any man who has not had an experience and is having an ongoing experience of sanctification, no matter what you call exploit, is a waste. Because when God comes to reward, He doesn't reward based on the volume of your work. He rewards based on the quality of your work. He said when God comes to redeem the counsel of the heart, then He will reward every man. So if sanctification has not become a factor in your soul, even your wealth can become your cause. Your abundance can become your plague. It is what has robbed a lot of people of relevance with God. Paul will write to a man called Archippus. He says, Say unto Archippus to take heed unto the ministry that he has received of the Lord. A man presses it to God until he receives a ministry. But along the line, something happens and his grip over what he received from the Lord became faint. And Paul will caution. Paul will caution. Because whether you will count in the world to come is dependent on your grip on God. Have you come to that point where nothing, nothing can affect your result? A man like Paul made some statements that were dangerous. He said, what can separate us from the love of God? The guy had evaluated everything. He had not seen anything in time that had the power to separate his connection with God. What is it? He was asking himself, what is it that can separate us from the love of God? Have you come to that point? If you have not come to that point, it means the devil can still manipulate your destiny. You may not notice it. You may not know it. But over time, when you check your life, you will discover that the things that were your emphasis 10 years ago, when you were born for God, those things now are like stories. You will look back and say, oh boy, now, wow, somebody is still in time, and they say, when we were born for God, it's a cause. Paul will make statements like, I know how to abound, and I know how to abase. And on the strength of that, he said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So strength for Paul was not just the miraculous. It was the ability to stay focused, standing and accurate with God, regardless of circumstance. I told you yesterday that the original translation is, I am Lord over circumstances. The guy is not that far to prosperity. But prosperity or no prosperity, he is gallant to God. That is a Christian. Some of us, our standing with God is so weak. We went for orientation camp as compass. And then we saw women that in 21 days of camp, they had to remove their ring. You see their hand, you see the sign of ring, they had to remove it so that they can fraternize with them. 21 days. 21 days. The work, the texture of someone's relationship with God can be damaged in 21 days. Some thought they were strong. First three days in camp, they were preaching everywhere. On the 11th day in camp, when we are standing, you see some people show down on ladies. They are just three ladies hanging on them. That guy was an evangelist of camp for three days. But the texture of his work with God could not survive for 21 days. It is the quality of service that we have. Perhaps they were fellowship presidents when they left the university. Perhaps some of them were JCC presidents. They organized crusades. They saw the power of God move. But they were isolated from fellowship and brought to Babylon. And they could not survive in Babylon because there is no sanctifying power working in their soul. You may think you are strong until you have every opportunity to seem comfortable. That's when you understand whether your soul has stamina. You may think you are strong until circumstances collide with you. 
That's when you will understand whether you have a stand with God. When God judges us, He is not carried away by our manifestation. Your manifestation is dependent on your revelation of the finished works of Christ. That a man is manifesting dimensions of God does not mean he has an hand in the spirit. If you meditate sufficiently on new creation realities, and that revelation hits your soul, you can walk effortlessly in the gifts of the spirit. But the things that define the stability of a man's soul is the quality of sanctification that he's exposed to. That's why when Paul would elders, there was no gift of the spirit mentioned. And when God comes to judge us, judge our relationship with Him, it's not carried away by our manifestation. He judges the extent to which our convictions are built in Him. I told you the story of Noah yesterday. Noah took 100 years to build an ark. And in 100 years, he was walking by the gift of the Sabbath. Because every dimension of that ark, he saw it in the spirit. The highest manifestation of discernment of spirit. A man carried out a project of 100 years and every dimension of that project was revealed to him in the spirit. But when God came to join the texture of Noah's relationship, God didn't mention his ability to see into the spiritual. God said, Noah feared him. He said, when God spake, Noah moved with fear. So for 100 years that Noah was operating in the spirit realm, all God was judging was the quality of his reverence. And that was what the spirit of God bore testimony. You can be doing so much but the foundation of your relationship is faulty. If God wants to help you, he will remind you of your first love. He came to the church in Ephesus. They walked in all dimensions of the spirit. In fact, they had discernment so much that they were proving the apostles. They will look at you and say, no, you are wrong. You are correct. And they were accurate. But God came to say, I have one thing against you. That power that was in your soul, that caused you only to walk because I asked you to. That influence that I have over your soul, that was your predominant motivation in everything you do. Your first love. Say you have lost it. A church that was doing wonders for Jesus. Jesus came. And Jesus had something against it. He said, You have lost it. And if you don't return to it, I will remove your candle from where it is standing. So God is not so moved by our influence and impact in the territory. He is first of all committed to the quality of our relationship with Him. And I say, If you are not careful, you may begin to pursue things instead of God. This is why we need sanctification. And this is why sanctification is no longer preached in many quarters. Because if it is truly preached, most of the things we say, we can't see them anymore. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lamb. Glory to the Father. Who was seated on the throne. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lamb. Glory to
That's how the motors touch. When they come, they find out where are you standing. The moment you lose your standing with God, you lose everything. He came to Adam. Adam was still in the garden. He had not left the garden. But God could not find him where he was standing. He said, Adam, Adam, where are thou? Where are thou? You are not in this garden because it's a location. There's a place you stand in the spirit. If you step out of that place, you have lost the garden. The guy was still enjoying in the garden, but the spirit came and said, I can't find you where you were standing. Where are thou? He was still in the garden, but God was looking for him. Millions in your camp, but God comes to say, Where are you? Where are you? I can't see you. You no longer appear on the radar of heaven. The reason you count on earth is because you have a place in the radar. When God checks you, He's looking for you in the radar. You are not there. Be one by time. You are walking. You are doing this. You are gathering this. And then the Spirit comes to say, Where are you? Where are you? We are now. So, wise men, they first of all secure a place with God. They stand in the presence. Elijah came to the palace. He said, Before God, who might stand? You may be seen in the palace, but the reason I have impact here is because I'm standing somewhere. Before God, who might stand? Jesus will be walking in Galilee and he will say, The Son of Man, which is in heaven. So, where is heaven? I talked to him in Galilee. He had to understand. And in John chapter 17, verse 22, he said, For their sakes I sanctify myself, so that they too might be sanctified. That means nothing you do will count before God unless, first of all, yourself is sanctified. It was possible for Jesus to teach the apostles' doctrine, it was possible for Jesus to teach them the supernatural, but he knew they would never count. So he said, For their sakes I sanctify myself, so that they too can be sanctified. So the work did not begin with preaching. The work did not begin with signs and wonders. The work began with torture. It began with purification. It began with consecration. So Paul will tell Timothy. In 2 Timothy 2 19, he said that standard of God is standard sure. This one God doesn't compromise. The standard of God is sure. They that name the name of the Lord must depart. You have no altar, you have no platform, you have no voice unless you have first of all gone through the corridor of sanctification. You have no message, no matter how intelligent, theologically accurate it is, you have no message. You will scream, but you have no impact in the spirit realm. You'll be talking to people about the love of God, you'll be talking to people about righteousness. They will be under your church and administration for 10 years. But if God comes to evaluate, it will be a bank of fornicators. Because the spirit of immorality, you can't challenge him. You are not advising people to live right. You are actually warring against the force that want to eat their soul. That's why you must first be sanctified. This is why we scream in church. But it doesn't reflect in the life of the people we preach to. Today is Sunday. Go to Lagos. Every street is dry. I left the airport around 2.30 yesterday. I got here by 5. Because of the hold of the traffic. But I can route that route now in 30 minutes. On Sunday, everybody in church. But on Monday to Saturday, you go to the street and you find Jesus bells. You find dogs and cleaners. And when you ask what is their name, then the name is Christian. The name is Titus. The name is Paul. <laughs> FBI wanted to bust criminals and 18 Nigerians. 18 Nigerians. Are we the only criminals in the world? But the highest number of churches is in Nigeria. 18 Nigerians busted. How many people are these thieves now? Is it? All of them are prophets and pastors. All of them. I like telling them, God will keep you. You will prosper. They are prospering, but they are thieves. 
He said, I wish above all things that thou mightest prosper and be in hell, even as your soul prospereth. So if your soul is not prospering with God, you have no prosperity. He said, He has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that called us to glory and virtue. He said that we may be partakers of His divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So a man who is still under the bondage of corruption, as far as the portion of heaven is concerned, is the poorest man on earth. That's why Paul said, if only in this life we have hope, we are all men most miserable. So you see, millionaires, they think they are living. God pities them. Some of them, they are tied to him. Look at the rich man. He said, fool, you fool. That was a millionaire among men. When he shows up, everybody claps. Odogu, Ikeka, Omekanaya. But in heaven, he has one title. You fool. That's his name. Here. Because he doesn't have a standing with God. The only cure to the infirmity of the soul is the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit. This is why again and again we go before the Lord and we say, Purge our hearts. Purge us again. He say, I, the Lord, I try the leaves to give up to every man according to his ways. God blesses the man to the degree of his soul quality and relationship with him. When a man becomes richer in the natural than the wealth of his soul, he has already come under the influence of the God of commerce. Mammon has taken over his soul. He may not be aware. That's one of the greatest crises of Christianity in Lagos. All the big churches, you will have to hear where iniquity is judged. Every Sunday is vengeance against the devil. It's vengeance against poverty. It's vengeance against the Their soul is the gate to the devil that has authority over their lives and circumstances. The devil can't. Jesus said, The priests of this world, they are finding nothing. So you can do all the prayer and bind all the demons if your soul is not sanctified. And purify and separate unto God. You will do that prayer for all your life. The sanctifying power. It is what addresses the corruption of the soul. It's so unfortunate that the church has prospered in finances. The church has prospered in influence. Many territories owned by churches. But the prosperity of the soul is lacking. 50,000 Christians, no one can stand. But in the days of the apostles, 12 men, 5 men were praying in one place. Apostles chapter 13, 5 people. The Holy Ghost came and separated two out of the five. Those five went and conquered many nations. Thinking in church. Christ lifted them abroad and one ticket entered the city and took that city for Jesus. He said, Philip went to Samaria. He preached Christ there. The city was full of joy. That was not an apostle. That was not among the twelve. He was a man that was consecrated to attend to them. Today, when you send your associate pastor to London, after three months, the name of your church will change. The name of the ministry will change. That's why you come to church. The geo, everybody occupying the big position are his blood relative. The people is teaching the word of God can't trust them. I thought we said we are Zion. I thought we said we are God. All 
the people registered the Corporate Affairs Commission as stakeholders. All the mega branches, check, they are either connected with people by blood or by marriage. Because he knows if he allows that church in the heart, even we can trust the quality of our work. We can. It's with calculation that we relate to ourselves in church. A perfect man of God, but he has all the signs and wonders, but he will never be posted to his city. They will send him to the village to live. All the branches in Europe is needed. The quality of his tenants in the But in the days of the apostles, it was the Holy Ghost that determined who was it. Separate unto me Paul and Barabbas for the work. It was the Holy Ghost. It was not by strategy and administration. It was the Holy Ghost. They talked in Antioch had a challenge. They said, please the Holy Ghost and us that we should not leave them with one body. Every action was inspired of God. And it doesn't matter who God says. The guy can be in that kissing class. If God says he's the one he's moving. No prearrangement to find no. Now we have 1,000 principles of loyalty. God's church is about a man. And then we want to challenge principalities and powers. We don't know who they are. <laughs> we don't know who those beings are. If you know who a principality is, you will know you can't talk unless you are under government. We don't know who they are. That was the last, that was the last, the last revelation that Paul taught him. In his address to the churches. He was communicating about warfare at that level. He pleaded with the job for him. Because we undermine the spirit realm. <laughs> he said, finally my brethren, <laughs> this matters now. They are not matters for children. Be strong in the power. And in the power of God. Put on the armor of God. Because you can prosper with principles. You can succeed with discipline. But to engage these entities that rule over territories. He said, put on the whole armor of God. He said, have you done all to stand? These guys are. At the age of 12, Jesus was manifesting. They don't really bother about it. When he saw that Jesus had blessed him to God beyond the normal threshold, he showed up. See, the reason why you think most of the things you see are stories is because you have not pursued God enough. There is a place you will press spirit into a body. Yes, Jesus confounded the doctor, Lord. The devil looked at him and said, Well, he's growing with wisdom. Let's be wisdom. He may have wisdom and succeed, I can his soul. He may have one, I can still rule over his soul. He may have influence, I can still rule over his soul. Because all of those things, they are based in the hands of the devil. So come on, let's grow in wisdom. Let's grow, let grow in power. A point came. He saw Jesus now went to John the Baptist to be baptized. Okay. This man, there is something happening in his soul that is not normal. This man is broken. You that the whole of Judea is singing your name, how will you go to John the Baptist? John recognized him and said, No, 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 no. Jesus says, Suffer him to be so for now. Thus, it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. The devil stood up from his throne. The Pharisees were so popular and revered that they saw them like gods. You couldn't even start a ministry until they give you a meditation. That's how powerful they were. But the devil knew they were light because it's in way their soul, their soul was light. Everything they did, they did for the praise of men. As long as they work for men to praise them, the devil knows this one cannot do anything. Here is the 
a man that has wisdom more than the Pharisees, more power. And then this man comes to lead the wisdom. This man is moving in the direction that a man don't walk. As if it was not enough, he got up from the baptism. God himself spoke about him. Okay, now you become proud. The guy was still down like a lamb. Ah! Uh-uh. God appeared the problem. Said, This is my philosophy. He still doesn't affect your soul. What is it about your soul? He knew that a man who can challenge you has appeared. Others can make you prosper, others can give you money. But the man that can challenge me has come. This one, his soul is under government. God announces you publicly. You are still humble. The Bible said Jesus in Matthew 4 1 was driven into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. He saw that this guy was under government. And the moment he saw that his soul was aligned, he knew his kingdom was under threat. Listen, we can do signs and wonders meeting. The priests in Lagos will not even come to church. They were casting out demons before Jesus came. When Jesus came and casted out devils, they said, ah, it's by principle. So they are aware of it. They know the supernatural. They are not moved by it. So you can organize healing meeting here. The priests of Lagos will not come. But when the men kneel down and begin to cry, the Lord will you have to will show up. Because this one, you are dealing with their soul structure. And if you can affect their soul, they can come under the government of heaven. And every man that comes under the government of heaven has one purpose in time to fulfill the will of the Father. Jesus said, In the volume of the book, it is written of me, I come to do thy will. And the will of the Father is the threat of the devil. This guy went to the wilderness and fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. The devil didn't wait again. It will be a risk now for me to allow this man to put up. This thing you are doing, you are behaving like the Son of God. But let's prove you if you are the Son of God. If you are the Son of God. Because he checked through time. Many great men rose. He saw Samson when Samson showed up. He went to Samson. Samson fell on the lap of the world. So everyone that showed up had a crisis with his soul. For the first time, a man came and his soul structure was perfect. He came to him. The Bible said, after Jesus had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterwards and hunger and the tempter came. He checked him out at the time that should be his weakest moment. And when he came at that time, Jesus now revealed that when we give away our total ability, it is replaced by divine ability. So what the devil thought was his weakest moment was his calculation. As he showed up, Jesus did not obey the dimensions of God. And he knew he had lost the battle. Instantly, he entered the city and the Bible said, Light had come. So, for the ministry of the Pharisees, the city was in darkness. Because for the first time, men heard a word, repent. He went for their soul. For the first time, beyond principle, somebody was attacking the soul of the wicked. Others came. Say, if you want to prosper, give, it should be given to you. Tired, you will receive. Nothing wrong with it. But their teaching could not touch the foundation of the souls of men. The moment Jesus came, he went for their souls. He went for their souls. For God has anointed me. For God has anointed me to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Somebody came now with the will of God in his tongue. And the Bible said, light had come to darkness. How about the prophets that were there? How about the preachers that were there? The quality of the soul made the difference. If your soul does not come under the government of God, you will be swallowed up by labels. Because if you don't change this world, this world will change you. You don't know what is happening in Lagos. You think Lagos is a center of commerce. This is a hall of spirit dwelling. The strongest principalities in this nation, they live in Lagos. If you come to this city in six months, 
Six months is too much. You will become a Lagos person. It will throw the way you talk, the way you act. Everything about you will become a negotiator because of the powers that work in this city. And that is the greatest influence over the soul of men. How do you think God will deliver people from Egypt to carry them to the promised land? And then God, God himself told them that they were going to live in the land over 40 million in money. They were moving day and night. The supernatural was in front of them. They saw the pillar of cloud. They saw the pillar of fire. Every day and every night. But these same people will say they want to go back to Egypt to eat garlic and cocoa. How do you compare garlic and cocoa with honey? And this God that spoke is not like he was hidden somewhere. They were seeing him every day. They left Egypt, they first him, they let him open up. They walked through dry ground. All forms of miraculous, but their soul was not affected. Egypt was still in their soul. The foundation of their soul. Egypt had trained them so much that it doesn't matter even if God stood before them. Saw the power of God, they saw the provision. The Bible said, not even their sandals wore the way. The rocks brought water for them. He said, they walked and not one of them lacked anything. He said, when I said, oh Jesus, oh Jesus, the abundance of life, they were enjoying it in the desert. They asked for meat, God brought meat. But their soul was eating. And God would not help them. All of them perished in the wilderness. Because if a man's soul is not sanctified, he is not relevant to God. The people that God invested all of his power, in fact, God himself will say, I delivered you from Egypt with a strong hand. Even the magicians of Egypt, they say, this one is the thinker of God. So much deployment of divine power, but their soul could not change. So with the great ability of God that was manifested, we have no choice but to destroy all of them. The generation from Egypt, only Joshua and Caleb entered Egypt. Every other person that entered Egypt did not know, entered the promised land, did not know Egypt. They were born in the wilderness. The man that they saw could not be affected, couldn't make it. The Bible said Joshua and Caleb were men with the deep spirit. Before you want to do so much for God, check the texture of your soul. That's where the devil will fight you. Because if he compromises the texture of your soul, what you do doesn't count. Men can tell you you can be popular, but he knows in the spirit you have no identity. So the Bible said in the great heart, there are many vessels. Vessels of gold and silver, of earth and of hay. Some want to honor, some want to return. But the key to become an honorable vessel is that if a man punches himself, if a man punches, so honor is not what you can do. There is a kind of service that the vessel of gold renders. There is a kind of service that the vessel of silver renders. But the, what the kind of service doesn't matter unless the quality is first of all affected. He said, it's when a man punches himself. That's when it can be honorable. Whether it's gold or silver, doesn't count. You can be the one on the microphone. You can be the one cleaning the toilet. You can be the one giving the seed. It doesn't matter. What will give value to your service is the quality of your soul. The guy preaching on the altar, at the time he's on the altar, the service may look as if it's about him. Somebody's recording there. Somebody's cleaning the toilet. Somebody's attending to the children. Your position may look as if it's not honorable. But God said you are not honorable because of the kind of service or the quality of service. They said they want to do a project, you can be the only person that gives billion. It doesn't mean you are honorable before God. All the projects in the past 10 years, you may be the only one giving. Because of human sentiment and the nature of our economy, pastor can be the more nice to you. And don't blame pastors. We need that money. <laughs> My brother, if there is no money in ministry, there will be crisis. So we can 
be nice. You know? If you don't have a red correct you can even be more nice when the guy giving you money than the guy giving you prayer. Because the intercessors don't know. They come for prayer meeting, they are fine. Oh, 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 oh. They do it for three times a week. They will come and prepare a wine for wine. But the guy that gives one million, why do you come to stand up from your seat? My son. <laughs> Among them, you might be honorable, but have you checked with God to find out whether you are honorable in the spirit? Because the truth is that everything in time is a passageway. Our destination is not time. Our destination is eternity. So you should strive to be honorable. So that scripture in 2 Timothy 2.21 was telling us, it's not the kind of things that makes you honorable. Your kind of service may be gold service. It may be silver service. But you are not honorable because your service is gold service. And somebody else's service is earth. He said your service becomes honorable to the degree that you bought yourself. He said if a man purchases himself from these things, then he shall be a vessel unto honor. That's where your giving becomes a tool to record with the spirit. A man can give and by giving, the power of God moves. A man can pray by praying the power of God moves. Because all of them are service before God. You can invoke the anointing from the giving of a man. The Bible spoke about Cornelius. He said that offering and almsgiving have risen unto heaven as a memorial. So his giving provoked a divine encounter. His giving provoked a divine experiment. Angels were mobilized to invite Peter to come quickly. Why Peter was yet speaking, the Holy Ghost fell on them. So your giving can provoke the strongest anointing. The same way your prayer provokes anointing. You know, nowadays we think it's prayer that provokes anointing. Every kind of service in the kingdom can provoke the anointing of God. But the difference is much. The reason why prayer is to be more effective is that you cannot pray accurately without being punished. Or you can give without being punished. That's why prayer seems to be too effective. Every service in this kingdom can provoke the hand of God. The same encounter that prophets provoke, or then was provoked by his giving. So honor in the kingdom is not what you do. Church has become politics. People run, do all kinds of things to be high in the church structure. That's because they don't understand what makes honorable in this kingdom. If you put yourself, you can be hidden at the back. God himself will pick you out. God pick you up. The Holy Ghost told me, he said, it is me that makes men in this kingdom. And when God speaks of making a man, he's talking beyond time. May God help us not to be miserable Christians. So that after we leave time, we will still be relevant. We will not vanish into oblivion. A moment of breath will keep from our nostrils. We will be relevant with God. Party, party, party is the key of stature. Party is the key of rank in the spirit. Every favor you have from God will be wasted unless you understand how to report yourself. The next five minutes, I will show us three things that we will do consistently in order to stay poor. It's called restore the conference, right? I know some of you are anointed. You go for a meeting, you don't like this, people are falling down. Glory to Jesus. I know some of you have some form of money. Whatever God wants to do, you can give. Glory to God. I know some of you have influence in government, you have influence in civil society, and you can make an example for the kingdom. Glory to God. 
But if you don't want all your service to be a waste, then you must pay attention to what you Because you can put laughter in the mouth of another person while you are going to hell. You can sponsor the gospel to reach another person while you are going to hell. Because every time you gave, you gave for men to clap. So you do not need to work. Jesus said the Pharisees, they pray in the public to receive the approval of men. He said they already have their reward. What a sorrowful kind of life. A man commits all his life to pray. And the only reward he has is that we call him pray. You. They will see him, they will say, the way this man prays, then he will say, the mercy of God. But when they come for the fellowship, he positions himself in a strategic place. He's not going to connect to him. He wants to make him pray. So, you will not pray, you will be praying. When people get tired, oh, oh and he knows that the worth of everybody has gone down, then you begin to hear pray. No, 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 these things are so delicate, but they can define who you are. Church as project, the man will not do anything until they are in the setting where people gather. He said, uh, uh, by the blessings of God, uh, uh, him and his family will give one million. If you meet that same, it can't be let out. What beat to live your life so that men can for you? What beat? I told myself, no man can make me feel I have more value. I have found out from still, so I know who I am in Christ. Everything you are saying positive about me is only confirmation. I heard it from God. And the ones God has not told me to buy me. So I will not do anything to impress you. I have served in ministries. Where people do things to impress you. Prayer yes, meeting is going on, everybody sit down, they are tired. Until a certain man enters. Then you see men of prayer. They are praying and in case you see them. Oh, 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 oh. They are turning. Oh, 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 oh. Anytime they know you see them. Oh, 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 oh. The soul is defective. They said they want to give to sponsor something. Pastor, we give 50,000. But the brother comes and says, Please, please, I'm trying to pay my school fees. What is the meaning of 5,000? The guy will say, Car. But things are hard. Things are hard. The guy needs to complete his school fees. And you say you are a giver. You are not a giver. You are a monster of praise. <laughs> it's a praise of men you pursue. And you know, the devil is. A man will give anything for God. And then, Pastor, get very close. And Christianity in Lagos is hard. You know, I told you something yesterday. It looks as if Christianity is difficult in a territory of persecution. But that's the easiest place to start God. The most difficult place to serve God is a ground of pleasure. It's a ground of abundance. The hardest place to serve God is a place of abundance. The easiest place to serve God is a place of persecution. That time we don't have any choice. Have you not gone to places where people pray to survive? For every morning you wake up, you hear bomb blast. So that you go out and come in without the bullet piercing to your body, your step needs to be ordered by the Lord. Greetings, good. Greetings. These principles, they are eternal principles. They work anywhere, any day, any time. It's called the protocol of sanctification. Everything God does is definite and well organized, programmed and systematized. 
Transformation doesn't happen to you all of a sudden. It is worked. It is worked. The same way, corruption is also worked. Every time you fall, you will discover you didn't just work up and fail. It was worked. We have come said with many young people, we go out this things work. They never want a young man to commit immorality. First of all, he carries him around people that speaks about it. Then he begins to hear things. He begins to hear things. And then he puts curious. How does this thing work? Then he says, okay, let him read about it so that he will stay safe. Meanwhile, he knows that it is his lust that is already activated. But he deceives himself very loudly and says, no, I want to read and know about it so that I will know how to avoid it. And then he reads and then he says, okay, maybe you should watch it so that we will know how to prevent it until he sets a sleep point in his soul and the demons come and they begin to amplify. They begin to amplify. They begin to amplify. And then the lady that was very rigid with men, all of a sudden, just like in this main friends now. And then he becomes very liberal. Open, play with them. And then it builds up. The gestation period continues. But some people is one week. I told them on the camp, right? 21 days. Some people may be six months. But corruption is worked. Who know? That's why James said, you sin because you are drawn by your own lust. The same way sanctification is worked. You don't wake up overnight and become something bad. It's a protocol you commit yourself to every day. I will show you three out of five things. The first precursor of spiritual sanctification is called protracted prayer. Protracted prayer. I told you, I deliberately want to keep it calm this morning so that when we hear the principles I will emphasize it until you can't get out. When you go and you begin to struggle, these walls I'm speaking, they will attack you. They will stand as a witness. And you can't deny that you don't know. When they bring pride, sometimes they know you are a man of God, so they want to make it easy for you. They say, well, um, take this little stupid and allow us to do this thing. Then the Holy Ghost is shouting in your ear, it's pride, it's pride. But you say, how do people make money pride? They just say, beyond the walls that are beat you, your souls and your heart are also talking to themselves. So you can like yourself with your wall, but the energy that is flowing from your spirit cannot be denied. This is why we will pound these things. Sanctification is not discipline. It's not resolution. Sanctification is an inner working of God in a man, so that that man becomes like God. It is God himself that sanctifies a man. Your duty is to cooperate with him. So this precursor I'm giving you is the cooperation that is required of you so that the Holy Ghost can walk God into you. Jesus said something. You know, in the days of the law, they thought the law was difficult. I hear people now that are saying, we don't obey the law. We don't obey the law. What we have now is more difficult than the law. That's why we need grace. Because without grace, you can't survive now. In the days of the law, you have not fornicated until you slept with somebody. Now, if you look at somebody lost it, you are in, you are guilty, are as guilty as the man that slept with somebody. So the standards were not even well interpreted by Moses. Moses didn't interpret. It was when Jesus came that he began to interpret the part that Moses left out. 
the standard is more difficult. So if you think you can survive by discipline, you are a joker. You can say you are a virgin because you have used discipline. You are 25 years. You have not slept with a man. You are a joker. When God exerts you in the spirit realm, every time you desire that man and you did it in your mind, you are guilty. So it is by spiritual purity you have failed the test already. Because God judges you from the three realms of your constitution. Whether it's your body that did it, or your soul that did it, or your spirit, you are guilty. That's why the man ate the fruit with his mouth, but his spirit died. The spirit of man was not guilty in the garden of Eden. It was his body and his soul structure that was guilty. The Bible said he looked at the fruit, he saw that it was desired for it, for me, and he ate it. So he spit his soul and his body were participating. But the man died in his spirit, his soul, and his body. So it doesn't matter whether it's your body. Discipline can keep your body. It's very important. In fact, self-control is one of the fruits of the spirit. But it's beyond discipline. Because discipline can keep your body. But discipline may not be able to keep your soul. Your soul is manipulated by the predominant influence of the spirit that inspires it. So if the information enters your soul, the inspiration enters your soul is from a spirit of water. Whether you try, no matter how you try, you will be having lost your mind continuously. Because your soul is different from your body. Your body can be subjected, not your soul. Your soul can only be revealed. If your soul were to be subjected, then you can use discipline on your soul. But your soul only aligns by renewal and transformation. And it is the presence of God and the revelation of His life that renews the soul. So the psalmist said, How then can a young man keep his weight? He said, By taking heed unto thy word. Chapter 1, line, verse 9 and 11. He said, Thy word have I put in my heart that I will not sin against you. So he's not sinning against God because by discipline he restrained himself. There was something he was doing to his soul. So that his soul can be on the same page with his body. Protracted prayer is that spiritual intelligence that downloads the dimension of God into the soul of man. A man who cannot stay in prayer for long is in the day of trouble that he will discover that his strength is small. When challenge comes, he will realize that his strength is small. The only way to build strength in this kingdom to resist the influence of darkness is by the business of prayer, protracted prayer. The Bible said, You dearly beloved, in Jude 1 20, before 20, verse 19, he said, Those other ones, he said, they are sensual. So they have separated themselves, having not the spirit. So the reason the people were sensual, the reason the people were ruled by their senses, is because the spirit influence was not there. He said, But for you, in order to download the influence of the spirit, he said, Build up yourself by in the Holy Ghost. So what will differentiate you from the sense rude ones? What will differentiate you from the sensual ones? Is the degree which you do business in the place of prayer. But you will notice that prayer is one element that is all a part of our posterity. All of us are 168 hours in the week that just passed. But if I ask you how many did you spend in prayer, you will discover that there are less than one percent Christian that give a tight prayer per week. And we want to be like God because we think his magic, we think his prophecy. Prophecy don't make you become like God. Prophecy commands your circumstances to align with the will of God. What makes you become like God is your yielding to the protocol of sanctification. The reason we are in church or we are godless is because we don't subscribe to the institutions that God put in place to orchestrate transformation on our inside. So we gather in church in our number, we attend all the fellowship, but there is no prayer as part of our lives. 
He said in Isaiah 40 verse 28, he said, have you not heard? Has it not been said to you that the everlasting God came dead not? Neither is he willing. God doesn't know how to faint even if he wants to. He doesn't know how to be overwhelmed and perfected by circumstance. It is the nature of God to live above the influences of creation. That's intrinsic with him. They say, but concerning the youth, he picked the youth because it is in your youthful age that you are defined by strength. In your own age, you are defined by wisdom. The Bible said the glory of a young man is his strength. But he said, look at the youth. Even the youth shall faint and be weak, and the young men shall utterly fall. That means every other strategy, apart from the one God has put in place, will is what in your fall. For you to stand like God, God and sanctify, there is something you need to subscribe to that is not among the natural content. He said, For they that wait upon the Lord, they shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like the eagles. Something has happened. Because they waited, a new system of dominance was put back to them. And suddenly, they discovered they began to ascend. That means the position where they were, by their natural advantage, was a low position. By waiting on God, they began to ascend to the realm of God. They shall mount up with wings like the eagles. And in verse 31, Suddenly, the youth that fainted, the youth that was weary, the youth became like God. They shall run, they shall not be weary. They shall walk, they shall not faint. But the breaking news before was that, have you not heard that the everlasting God fainted and that is still weary? When a man begins to wait on God, something happens. You can also say, have you not heard that God is never weary and that does he faint? The same tensions of God can become the credentials of man. Some say it's impossible to be on earth be holy. They don't know what holiness is. Some say it's impossible to be on earth and be pure. That's because they have been laboring with their strength. So because they are falling, they think every other person is falling. This is the Bible. Any man that waits upon the law is possible for that man to sustain the credentials of God. The same way God is never willing, that man can live without being willing. The same way God does not faint, that man can live without fainting. The technology is not discipline, it's not struggle, it's God waiting, protracted prayer. You can't wait in the presence of God by prayer. Your soul can never come under the government of the Holy Ghost. You will find yourself struggling to do the things that God says you are. This is why the doctrine of legal righteousness and experiential righteousness came. Because suddenly there was a gap. God, as far as God was concerned, the moment you were forgiven, you were supposed to begin to walk in the economy of who you are in Christ. But many people don't subscribe to the protocol. The day this protocol becomes part of your life, then you shrink the gap between legal righteousness and manifest righteousness. The difference between legal righteousness and manifest righteousness is the protocol of sanctification. You give yourself to it, everything Jesus says you are, you begin to manifest it. Because Jesus didn't come to tell us stories. He came to bring us into reality. The spirit influence. You download it in protracted prayer. That's why most of you discover when you pray for 30 minutes, there's challenge. Either you sleep off or you get tired. That's because the energy you run your life with is the energy of the flesh. And now you are about to engage the spirit. That energy doesn't suffice. The same way you can't use that energy to engage God. That's the same way you cannot use that energy to engage the demon. The reason the demon always comes and manipulates your life is because you confront it with your human energy. If you want to replace your human energy with the energy of God, this is the strategy. So you stay there until God places your weakness with his strength. The protocol of sanctification. When a man stands with God until his energy is broken and God flows into him, then the things that were contending with him, the next time they show up, they contend with God. The God that has broken into his soul,
comes with response. So when the demon comes with a temptation, it is not energy that responds to the demon. So suddenly the man discovers that effortlessly he is walking to God. He is enabled to enter into your rest. Press until that energy becomes your dominant energy. And then you will find yourself in rest. The things you try to do, you will do it naturally. That's why God did not come to take the laws away. God came to give the ability to do the laws. So what you did in order to please God, we now do as a lifestyle. Till tomorrow God will not allow you to communicate. Till tomorrow God will not allow you to prevent. Till tomorrow God will not allow you to serve another God. So which law are you saying is abolished? What was abolished is the requirement of the law for justification. Now justification is in Christ, but doing the law of him was always. So we don't do it now to be justified. We do it as our lifestyle. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not living pure because I'm trying for God to accept me so that some things can happen in my life. I walk in the reality of that because Jesus made it happening. But I cannot walk pure because the love of Christ that I have known now constrains me. The sanctifying power. Never struggle to live pure. People call me. They are struggling with masturbation. They are struggling with morality. The cure is not far. The Holy Ghost trusts them to pray and they can't pray. They talk to God. Uh, 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 15 minutes they go away. They don't know why they remain puppets in the hands of the devil. You want to begin to walk like God in time. Make out time to pray. You will stay there and back you want to. So Christ. 15 minutes will look like 10 hours. You will keep pressing. Until you become 30 minutes. Until you become 1 hour. Until you become 2 hours. Until you become 10 hours. So every once in a while you go there. You do a surgery on your soul. And when you are done praying. Then your soul comes to an ascended state. That's when you can be walking in Lagos. But you will be in heaven. The things that happen to the people in Lagos do not know that the things that happen to you. They can't define you as a Christian. Even those who are in Lagos, they will say, this one is different. The Bible said it was in Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. In a ground of perversion, they saw that no, there was something different about this one. What every other person was a slave of, they lived above it naturally. No wonder the Bible said they gave themselves to prayer and the ministry of the world. Of sanctification. The second is what we call. Are you ready for something? Are you sure you are ready for something? Or you want me to stop now and release my. Will I jack it up? You are ready. Immortal. Invincible. You are ready. You are ready. This voice has suffered. following this thing the way I'm following like this. Because a lot of us are not necessarily different. We are proclaimers. So when we come to a place, we only complicate the body of God. If I sweep down, my elements will come on me. But I have to be calm to show you these things. In my speech, the only thing we know to do is to cry. He said, John was in the wilderness. And he was screaming. <laughs> Sometimes when you hear us, you think we are fighting pastors or we are fighting the church. No. The generation needs to be delivered. And it must rise up and cry against the status quo. So you may not 
understand what I'm saying, but the attacker will be shot at your soul. You will be hear it, you will not sleep anymore. You will be hear it, and you will begin to pursue God. And until you find God, principles will be a body. I tell them all the time, what we call principles, they are actually lives that are lived in the spirit. A principle is a manifestation of the nature of the spirit. So until that spirit gives you support, that principle will be you. The second principle of orchestrated divine sanctification is what we call dwelling on the word of God. God, 
They have titles of Christians, titles of prophets and apostles, but they don't have the business with the world. So the nature of God, the life of God, the character of the Spirit is not part of them. Because they don't have the dwelling place in the world. He said, as we beheld him, we began to see not the locusts, but the glory of the Father. And Paul, by the Spirit of God, began to teach us the technology of transformation that is in the glory. He said, as we behold, we are changed. The world is in the time of us. The same way the egg becomes a butterfly, that you cannot rationalize how it's possible. There is no similarity between the butterfly and the air is metamorphosis. You are a sinner, a drunk, a masturbator, a fornicator, a killer, but you began to sit on the wall. And suddenly, the more you see the wall, you no longer see the fornicator. You begin to see the righteousness of God. And after a while, you discover that the appetite was dead. How did it happen? You can tell you have been metamorphosed. You want to wonder, how, how, what was I thinking when I was drinking star? How was it tempting? You can't even remember anymore because you are no longer an air, now you are a butterfly. The butterfly has no similarity with the air. Metamorphosis has taken place. It is part of the intelligence of beholding the word of God to make you become exactly like that word. He said, as you behold that law of liberty, like a mirror, we are changed. This is why we dwell on the world every day. Jesus said to Satan, A man does not become the Son of God by turning stones into bread. He said, But it's by eating the word of God every day. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? The word. Eating on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So that was Jesus telling the devil, you don't become by infestation, you become by transformation. You don't become the Son of God by your ability to turn stones to bread. Manifestation don't the sons of God. Manifestation are byproducts of the sons of God. What makes sons of God is the transformation that comes from the One of the precursors of sanctification is dwelling in the word of God. This is what Christians in Lagos don't do. This is what Christians in Nigeria don't do. This is what Christians in Africa don't do. It is rightly said, if you want to hide something from the black man, hide it in the book. I tell you the truth, even salvation is far from the black man because it's hidden in the book. A big evangelist is coming, everybody goes there because they think when he says it's well, then it is well. He doesn't want to take responsibility for his life. Jesus was the word of God. But in Luke chapter 4 verse 16, he said he entered into the temple as busy as he was to read. He said he picked the scroll to read as his custom was. As his custom. I thought he was the word of God. Why does he need to read the word of God anymore? Because he's the author and the finisher of the faith. The thing Jesus was doing, he was not just doing for himself, he was showing one and how to live lives. Because he altered the part of faith. The only way you can walk in the experience of faith is to do it the way Jesus did it. For some of the things he did was to reveal to you how to live. So he started the Bible as his custom was. God will say to God, in First Timothy 4, 10, he said, until I come, give a ten times to reading, to exhortation, to thought. Let reading and studying the world become your lifestyle. But Nigerian Christians don't read the Bible. When he cried in London three weeks ago, he said, Many pastors don't know the Bible. They hear three messages and they concoct three messages from three messages that they hear. And they come to preach. What did the same scripture that the men of God put in? And they, they do the word of God. But we all with our pale faces. We hold in as in the clap, the image of the God. We are changed. We are too busy to do business with the word of God. That's why the more we grow in church, the more we become like the world. 
I told you yesterday, the time to find the most accurate Christian is when they just give their heart to Christ. That time they are genuine and they are pure. When they are in church for five years, they become like the world. The guy was the fornicator of the man Jesus. He abandoned everything. Born for Jesus. And then he was in church for six months. He now tells you he was married. These things are no longer church. When was the last time you carried the scriptures and sat on it because you wanted to find God? You wanted to know God. When was the last time? Paul will say, Let the word of God when you meet. Meet. To an extent that your motivations, your actions are all in form by the word of God. That is true prosperity. So you don't just grow in influence and power. You also grow in the nature of God. He made them in his image before he made them in his likeness. So until the likeness is built on the image, there will be no accuracy. Quality of your physical prosperity is the quality of your soul structure. Sanctification is the cure for the afflictions of the soul. you think you can do business with the spirit if you don't understand the ways of that spirit? How? The way his ways are far from human reason. How do you do business with them? Before you can work for a spirit, that spirit must first of all dominate you. Because men don't actually work for spirit. Spirit works through men. You're only called to cooperate. And you don't have that spirit on your inside. And then you say you are talking for God. That's why some people go to talk for God in the shrine and they come back with you. Because they think it's boldness. Some say they want to talk for God on the political corridor. They go there and they become puppets in the hands of man. And then the man says, Pastor, he say, Pastor. But everything he's doing is an outright defiance to the systems of the kingdom. The pastor will lie to defend the company, lie to defend the government. But he says he's talking for God. No sanctification. The last that I will talk this morning. I call you to the Holy Spirit. Remember, all of these actions, they have different implications. I say, when you pray, you download God into your soul. When you sit on the Word of God, your soul is reconfigured. That's why I say metamorphosis. When you yield to the Holy Spirit, your soul is purged. When you pray, you download God into your soul. That's why I said the same. When you sit on the wall, you will reconfigure your soul structure. But when you yield to the Holy Ghost, you purge your soul. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 3, I told you already, he said they will come as a refiner's fire. Most times you don't have any reason to stop. When you are struggling with any sin, just tell these things I tell you. They are not part of your life. So your quest should not be fighting sin. Your quest should be to labor to enter into his rest. Every time you discover lust is coming back, check. There's no protracted prayer. There's no dwelling on the word of God. You have become busy with these things. But Jesus, even as the Son of God, this were the things he did every morning. In Mark 1.35, the Bible said the great one in the morning. They went into a solitary place. There he prayed. That was why every time Jesus notices a temptation is coming, he begins to pray. After the Bible said the Holy Ghost led him to the wilderness to be tempted of the devil, the Holy Ghost didn't tell him to fast and pray. He knew temptation was coming, he began to pray. And he prayed for 40 days and 40 nights. When he was going to the cross, he saw that his will, his will was about to break.
buried him. He went to Gethsemane. He prayed until his he prayed his way into the will of the Father. Even Jesus had to subscribe to this question. And then you who have tasted of sin and have seen the pledge of sin, you think you will violate these things. And your soul will stand with God. It's a joke. Yielding to the Holy Ghost purges your soul. There are certain things that the spirit of this world fires into your soul. Only the Holy Ghost can remove it, like the traditions of men. I was discussing with my friend Mike last night. After turning in the place of prayer long, God began to speak to them. And he said, If I find an evil man that can take from the influence of money, I will give him everything. An evil man can be fire plan, but when money comes, all the traditions of the ancestors come back. That's the only place God can break. That time, even the relation can't break. Because if you bring one, you bring another one to capture you. I do not have things, I have to have those who have to Tradition, tradition. So difficult. Anybody will tell you, brother, I trade, I trade my battle. You have to pack it. You have to hustle. Everyone in his court is hustling. He's giving, you think he's giving because he loves God. If he gives after some time, nothing happens. I was going for an interview. They said we should give. We will be favored. I gave nothing happened. I went for another interview. I gave nothing happened. I know they give again. <laughs> Traditions of men. The only way man can be touched and read of those things is when he yields to the government of the Holy Spirit. That's when Bible study moves from revelational Bible study to transformational Bible study. The Lord begins to bring laws upon your soul. Abraham was so connected to his family. But what God wanted to do with Abraham was to start a new generation. Affiliation with his family would not enter into what God wanted to do. But there was no way God could help Abraham. God told Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, leave your, your country, leave your kingdom, leave your family, and go to the land I will show you. Abraham had an encounter with God. He had God. He knew it was God, but he couldn't move him. Because of affiliation, teachings, tendencies of the soul. It was his father that carried him from the hall of the chapel to heaven. It was after his father died that that addiction began to break. And even when Abraham left, he carried law with him. God wants to use you to change your world, but those patterns, that is the definition of your family, will never change. I have a lot of friends. When you meet us who are preachers from different locations, you can trace patterns that are consistent with where we come from, even with the way we talk about. A guy who came from the from the not John Axis because he's exposed to poverty. Every time he preaches the gospel, you see him fighting poverty. Fighting with you. As if poverty is the gospel. It defies his revelation. God must do something to him to shift his paradigm. Meanwhile, the guy who comes from the east, every time he preaches the gospel, the gospel must be money. There must be paradigm shift. Because the nature of God cannot become the nature of man unless man yields to the Holy Spirit. That's a layer of sanctification that is most significant. God purging your soul and making you to become come to him. When Abraham could not let go of God, God had to carry him through a journey. A journey of dealings. 
There's a kind of teaching the Holy Ghost wants to teach you. There's no way you can learn it by revelation. So he will allow you to go through the fire. It's when you pass through the fire and you are not born. That's when you can understand trust. He will allow you to go through the waters. So he uses things to teach you his ways. He appears to him. Spoke to Abraham, but Abraham will not obey him. So God began to teach him through another kind of thing. And in Genesis chapter 12, in verse 6, the Bible said that God carried Abraham through Sikhem and through Moreh and through Ai before he came to Bethel. I read those scriptures and stories. The apostles have to go to the You don't know what the Holy Ghost will do to bring your soul to a place and mirror him. When you see a man who is like God, he didn't get there overnight. But you see, he here at the table, he said, Ah, this man is humble. This man is humble. If he tells you what you hold and to him, you will say, No, this is not Bible. We have tendencies. And our dealing will be consistent with the nature of our tendencies. So that we can be chiseled. The word seeker is the word shoulder. The word more is the word teacher. So that path that God carried Abraham through was the path where God teaches my body. Because in the days of Abraham, you don't have any load on your head. So, because you will not hear God through an encounter, you will hear God in him. So, God began to teach him the way of transformation by bodies. That was why he carried Abraham who seek him in the before he got to Bethel. And the moment Abraham graduated from seek him and Moreh, two things happened. The first thing that happened was that. Abraham built an altar of the Lord that appeared to him. He heard the story of Noah. He knew about altars, but altars were not relevant to him because he had a family. Now God had brought the doctors to him that his family can no longer survive. You know, those people come from the university. One of my sisters, I saved her name as Central Bank. I saved straight name by God. Because anytime I had a need, I knew who to go. If things are so tight and nothing works, if I call Central Bank, when I go to town, my roommates will be waiting because they know that day is Chinese shopping. I will come with the letters like this. So I need Central Bank. When God wanted to begin to walk His ways into my spirit, God now not going to go to So the same place where I went, and plenty followed me. I went to those places and I went to that town. It's all seeking. Every time there's a challenge, you call A, you call B, you call C. When God wants to help you, then He blocks the path. Isaac was doing well in Kerala until the whole world started to go try to. And Isaac wanted to go to Egypt. So all the while that Isaac was prospering, his confidence was not in God. He believed in nature. Now, nature had claimed him. So he wanted to follow the other person in Egypt. God now says, Stay still in Kerala. And without water, he began to sow on dry ground. God wanted to show him that what made him was not a bounty that was weaved into nature. He was the one that formed the power to make wealth. And I see you go for the first time as El Shaddai. The self-sufficient one, the multi-breasted one. He knew he was blessed with what he was the descendant of Abraham, but his faith was not in God. So when he didn't walk here, he goes here. When he didn't walk here, so God taught him the same syllable that he taught Abraham. He says, Stay in this dry ground. Have you come to that point where you have many alternatives and God say, Don't. And then the more you don't, the more you suffer. You graduated from the university. Three uncles, 
Come to Lagos. Come to Abuja. Come here. God says, stay in the way. But my friends, God told him, he said, go to Suga Cross. You don't hear those doctrines anymore in the world. That's why we don't receive God. But the men that follow God like that, in the end of their pilgrimage, God blesses them with what he is. I heard about the priest who had There were three of them started. Two of the priests went to America. One became a BAD. A BAD holder in the most of He also made money. But today, the priest is not only the mighty of the earth, it's mighty in heaven. All opportunity to go. But the guy heard what God was saying. There's nothing wrong in taking advantage of the resources of nature and of the doors of favor that are to you. But never move what is is the will of God. We don't pursue opportunities, we pursue God. The way of seeking. That's how God punches a man. All your confidence will crash. Everything you believe you will gain. Then you will know what it means to call upon the name of the Lord. That's why Paul said, We. I don't know about other Christians, but we that walk the way we do, he said, We are the circumcision. That worship God in the spirit, rejoicing in Christ Jesus, having no confidence in the flesh. The Christian that can define his life like that is a Christian that has followed the Holy Spirit. He will put you onto everything that man wants an advantage. You don't have to have an advantage. The only thing you want an advantage will be the advantage of the Spirit of God. That's why a man can reject this world. It's a faith that rejects. But we are not taught that to bless your name. For us to begin to look like God again, then we must come under the covenant of the Holy Spirit. Times may not be favorable, but it is God walking something in you. It may not look pleasant, but it is the finger of God about to be revealed to you. The men that see the finger of God, they are the men that dare to walk with Him in desolate grounds. The men that are able to move the hand of the heavens, they are the men that are able to walk with Him in darkness. The men that can go through the fire, the men that can go through the waters. How many times have you run from the fire? Even when the Holy Ghost said, Move forward. Moses looked at the Red Sea. He turned to God. He said, Why do you cry to me? Go forward. Most of us have run away from our Red Sea. Most of us have run away from the circumstances that God put ahead of us in order to destroy us. Because we were taught that it God it must be good. We were not that it is only good when it is gone. There are times when it will be painful because it Times when it will be hard because it is God. And those are the times when the quality of our life is upgraded. When you look at the past, the things you will remember are the difficult times you went through. The times of pleasure you never remember them. Even though when you were going through them, you thought pleasure had no impact on your soul. But when you look back, the challenges you brought, they are the things you remember the most. Because those things they came to upgrade the quality of your life. That's how God raises men. He raises men through rocket terrains. So that those men can come to a point where they are able to look away from their circumstance. The Bible says, looking away unto all the author and the finisher of your faith. There will be no sanctification unless protracted prayer become part of our routine. There will be no sanctification unless the word of God the borderline of our daily economy. There will be no transformation unless you get next to the Holy Spirit becomes the deciding factor of our everyday work in time. This is the portion of Christianity that is exonerated and obliterated from our everyday doctrine. Men will no longer talk that suffering is not The Bible said Jesus can be obedient to the things he suffered. There is a place for suffering in this kingdom. There's a place for hardship. There's a place for crisis. But God turns it out for your good. God may not be the one to orchestrate it, but He says, You can make all things work good for them that love it. For them that are called according to His name. Some of the things we call crisis, some of the things we call trial, they are actually syllables in 
the school of the spirit. There's a level we will never enter unless we walk to those other lands. This is why I have presented many talkers, but many men can challenge principalities. Many revelations, but the priests are still in our territory. Many churches, but darkness is thicker by the day. Because men don't understand that only the Holy Ghost guides men into all reality. You may have got the measure of reality by revelation. You may have got the measure of reality by inheritance. But all reality can only be entered into as you walk with the Holy Spirit. See, I have many things to tell you. I have told you some things. You are aware of some things, but I have many things to tell you. You say, how big you can't achieve it. But when the Spirit of Truth is come, He will guide you into all truth. The Christianity we practice now is a Christianity that chases away the things that are not pleasurable. If the Holy Ghost wants to carry you away from your job, are you sure you can follow Him? If the Holy Ghost wants to carry you away from this city to the poorest part of this country, are you sure you can follow Him? If the Holy Ghost wants to carry you to a place of persecution, are you sure you can follow Him? The elders of old, they did not consider breakthrough as abundance. Abundance is part of breakthrough, but breakthrough is deeper than abundance. They consider breakthrough as their progressive walk with the Spirit of God. So a man breaks through when he comes into a higher level of authority with God. That was how they judged their lives. So Noah could move away from the civilizations of the world. Only God knew what Noah. Only God knew the position of Noah in his dead world. But he stepped away out of fear for God. And he began to build an ark. Only God knew the fame of Moses in Egypt. But Moses walked away. Only God knew the abundance, the affiliation of Abraham with his family. But Abraham walked away. If God says, walk with me, are you sure you can walk with him? Are you sure you are not saying you walk with God because you think walking with God will give you a car? Have you evaluated yourself? The Bible says, examine yourself to see whether you be in the faith. Are you sure the reason you are crying, God, whatever you say I will do, I will do. It's not because all your pastor, all your prophet, and all the messages you have been hearing told you that a man that walk with God will never lie. Are you sure your idea of walking with God is not the idea of not marking? If you really know what it means to walk with God, are you sure you are still with Him? The Holy Ghost comes and says, Leave your family, leave your job. Can you walk down with Him? For Abraham, the Bible said he didn't even know where he was going to. But he was looking for a city that had a foundation whose beauty and maker was God. And at the end of the day, they discovered that that city was not a nation, it was his life. When you read the Bible, it says he was taking the Israelites to a land flowing with milk and honey. Go and check Israel. It's the most dry ground in this world. There is no land as dead as the rich of where Israel is. So when God was talking about milk and honey, he was not talking about the land. He was talking about the resources that can flow out of the people because they are willing to follow him. And today, those guys are the best inventors in the world. Their watermelon is bigger than the watermelon for Benue. Benue and Benue is one of the most special ground in Africa. But the watermelon of the dry ground is bigger, far bigger than the one in Benue. Because those men, their lives have become concrete pipes to be the result of what they do. They are a manifestation of the multifaceted possibility that is called to be God. So when God knows a man, God wants to be that man. The journey may look broken, the path may look rough. But are you willing to trust? Our path is the path of faith. It's not the path of crisis, it's not the path of affliction, it's the path of faith. If you follow in faith, affliction can become for good. Abundance can become for good. But when they come to know the Holy Spirit, that's what our soul is near. We'll pray this morning. So, for a mentor, you find yourself in an addition. Stop fighting the addition. What you call an addition is an influence of the spirit. Stop fighting it, it's a waste of energy. You find an addition, make a prayer in your lifestyle. 
Make the study of the word your lifestyle. And every time the Holy Ghost touches your heart, you will be very big. You will discover that the things that were addition, they will fall off you on your own accord. You will look back and say, ah, this will not go. Even the taste of style and appear will die. The taste for immorality will die. You will not know when it happens. Do you know when you grow up? You just wake up and discover your shirt is no longer your size. Your shoe is no longer your size. Because growth is the process. That is how we grow in God. That's how sanctification is achieved. We know all the laws of excellence, all the laws of the anointing, all the laws of faith, but there is no sanctification in our lives. And the danger of it is when we finish from this war, that's when we discover that we were in waste before God. We saw the man that God himself called the fool. Who is a fool? The Bible said a fool is a man that says himself there is no God. That man, all his suffer as his sufficiency was his prosperity. And recommit everything to Jesus. Yesterday we came on knowing people and rededicating ourselves to God. Today we are going a bit further. We are dedicating even our resources to God. We are going to tell the Lord, I don't want to live for myself anymore. I want to live for you. I want to say everything you give me today I say it's not mine. I am only a steward in your house. You have the right over everything I have. You want to make that prayer? There you are, just bow your head and begin to talk to God. That's when the spirit will take you serious. The first time I have to empty my bank account. That was when I understood that this Christianity thing is actually dirty. <laughs> My brother, instead of death, you can't know life. It's actually death to sell. Jesus said, except the kind of wheat fall to the ground and dies, it abides in the home. The first time, and I didn't plan well, if I knew, I would have invested 90% of the money and left 10%. All the money I saved and preserved, the great one came and told me to carelessly give up my project. And meanwhile, this church I entered was not even my church. Nobody knows me there. I went to a program. I said, Empty your account. What do you mean? They wanted to build an altar. And God came and said, Empty everything. I'm not part of this church. People are giving. Why not I give what I want to give my faith? God was dealing with my soul. You may have all the revelation, but your soul will be lacking with infirmity. The Holy Ghost knows what your soul is tied to. He may break that call. And the way he does it is by creating the circumstances around your life. You may think you love God, but if God shows up and says, Leave Lagos and go to Medubri, I want to rape the people. You may know this is the voice of the devil. Hear stories of men of God. All of them prayed. All of them read the Bible. The difference was the quality of their obedience. Men wandered away from everything they built on their lives. Just to please the interest of the master. The Bible you read today, some people's family were born in their lives. Just to give up the only copy of the Bible, they refused. They burnt their families. For the Bible to get to your hand. Some were pierced. Some were sore as something. No wonder the Bible says for good ones. The world is not worthy for their names to be mentioned. The only place you can speak about people like that is in the height of Zion. It's God Himself that talks about those kinds of people. Men that were plundered in this world so that the will of God can find expression. They are scars in our generation. They are scars. We have big men of God, but we don't have men that won't be done. Everything is strategy. Everything is intelligent. We are only building systems and institutions. So the church resembles more and more the institutions of the world. 
Many people committing their all to church, but the more they commit to church, the more they become dead. Because the church is more focused on building institutions, not the souls of men. You want to make a commitment? All I am and all that I have, I give to you. Sometimes, go back and read the documents in the 17th century and see the that book of their so old. The saints of old, even the songs they sang, more than 70% of it bothered on the quality of their soul. Here are the songs we sing today. It's about abundance and plenty because we pursue things not come. It's in their day that you hear songs like the old rocket cross. You hear songs like God chastised me. You hear songs like God to refine me again. Their prayer point was full of God and empty of self. But our prayer points are full of self and empty of God. We may leave this world and discover we are small in heaven. And that's how we will discover that the plan of God for this world now is not to make the life. This world has one sentence, is death. He said the elements of the world will melt. He will erode this world the way that the cannot be. He just allows them so that we can invest sufficiently in eternity. But many of us, we are investing on earth. We have no investment in eternity. Many mansions. One man has 90 estates, but he has nothing with God. He spoke about the rich fool. He said, You are a fool. Plenty in this world, but you are not rich to us all. You will not be fools, but wise. Redeeming the times, because the days are evil. A rich young man came with us in Mark chapter 10. He said, I will follow you. He was saying, Go and sell everything you have. What are you willing to give up this money? What can you give up this money? Quality of your relationship with God. What can you give up? What can you give up? The kingdom rests on the shoulders of sacrifice. Only men of sacrifice understand the kingdom. And only on their shoulders can the kingdom be carried. Are you still living selfishly? It's a Luciferous nature. You want to come back to a place of authority with God. Then there are things you must give up. God wants with men that he has purged. He doesn't want with men that know so much about him. I assure you, you will not be lonely. Absence of people, absence of things is not loneliness. The Bible calls it alone. When you don't have people, you don't have things who are alone, you are not lonely. Loneliness is absence of the Spirit of God and its influence in your life. You are you are immortal, invincible. You are brave. You are immortal, invincible.
Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. You may be seated. God bless you. This morning again, it's my honor and privilege to be here to share the word of the Lord with you. I want to specially appreciate my dad in the house, God's servant, Pastor Sunday Abubaka and his beautiful wife. <laughs> also happens to be my mama. <laughs> Glory to God. You know, when you are a young preacher, you enjoy a lot of blessings. And one of those blessings is the blessing of spiritual covering. And you have men that have gone ahead, men that have paid the price, men that are able to boast different dimensions of God, providing you blessing and covering. And this morning, grateful to God to have such personalities in my dear father in the house. I also want to appreciate all the elders in the house this morning. Our professor who happens to be the chairman of council. Thank you so much sir. And everybody here, all the pastors, thank you for being the covering that our generation desperately needs. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'll be sharing the word of the Lord with us briefly this morning. And I will take time to pray for a while. See what the Lord will be doing. The pastor said something. He said, We are comforted in the Lord. And that's so encouraging. You know, for someone who just walked in to a situation like this on the ground, it's so difficult you know, to give expression to the Holy Spirit on your inside. This morning we trust that the Lord will be helping us in Jesus' name. Thank you, everyone that is here, those who came in because of the program. Thank you for coming. God bless you. I said yesterday that this is a very rich ground, very rich spiritual ground. Most of the revelations that have changed the body of Christ in our time and have given accurate perspective to what the Lord is doing. That's given us wisdom, counsel, and instruction on how to handle the things of the Spirit and to move in the Spirit. They came from this platform. Aside the fact that Dan is doing a great work here, this is the ground of Koinonia. <laughs> this happens to be the podium where the legendary apostle. Apostle Joshua Selman ministers for to the rest of the world. Such a great blessing to be standing on this podium. Uh, I stand here this morning greatly humbled, with great respect for his service to the body of Christ. You know, I was saying yesterday that I was hoping sincerely. Given that Koinonia was Friday and I came in on Saturday, I said maybe I will step on some of the places where he stepped. <laughs> so that by standing there myself, we receive impartations from the servant of God. It's such a humbling experience. And we trust that this morning, again, the Lord will be giving us insight that will be particular to what He wants to do in our lives as it will give us relevance what he is doing corporately in this dispensation. It's one thing to be very knowledgeable about the things of God, to be so vast about the things of God and to have readily with you the knowledge of what the Lord is doing in the generation. But there is an unfortunate possibility that can be dealt with such a one to know everything about what God is doing but not to be a partaker of it. Because it's not enough to know. It only becomes enough when you have the spiritual discipline to be subjected to the demands of what God is doing. Then you can be a partaker. You can know, and the more you know, the more you become proud and calm. 
but a man who sustains the disposition of yieldedness to the Holy Spirit in obedience to respond to the demands of the move of God in a generation is a man that will be part of the heritage of what God is doing. Paul came to the church of Corinth. These guys have mastered the ways of the Spirit so much that they displayed different gifts of the Spirit. They understood the teachings of Paul, they understood the teachings of Apollos. So Corinth became a ground of revelation. But when Paul came to diagnose the texture of the church in Corinth, Paul discovered they were kind of they were babies. So spiritual knowledge, dexterity in spiritual intelligence and oratorial capacity does not directly translate to depth and stature in the spirit. So most times you come to a place where there is so much revelation and you think you will find the best quality of Christians. But you'll be amazed that that is where you find the most shadow people and then you find the most proud people who are not partakers of what God does. So it behoves every one of us to become very humble, especially where we are, when we are in a place where God is doing what He's doing. For those of us who are of the remnant family, we interact with Apostle Arume every day, sometimes on a very informal note. And then if you are not careful, because you know him on an informal note, you become separated from what God is doing. People who hear about it from afar, they enter into encounters and spiritual experiences that most of the people who are on ground never have the experience of. Some become so used to these messages that they score it. But there are few others who just heard one of his messages and their lives are transformed. Even the extensive prayer exercise that we do every day in Revenant to some people becomes a religious routine. So they know that we pray every Monday to Wednesday for three hours and then we run vigils every Friday and then sometimes once in a month we run prayer stretch for 10 hours. So these things become religious routines. Meanwhile, somebody else hears a stay in a Christian land and a prayer movement begins. And that person in three months experiences a transformation that the one who is on ground for three years does not have. Because we become used to what God is doing. We know how the service is run, we know what the Holy Ghost will do, and we know the language. And that is why I told us yesterday that in order to maximize what God is doing, we need to go back to the message of the cross. And the Holy Spirit helped us yesterday to see that the message of the cross was the bedrock of apostolic doctrine. And I showed us from scriptures how the major emphasis of Paul's teaching was built from the cross. He said that Jews sought signs and wonders. The Greek sought wisdom. He said, but we preach Christ and Him crucified. And Paul said, on the strength of that message, our faith will not be built on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. He told the church in Galatia, in Galatia, that his doctrine was such that he was able to beat Jesus Christ on the cross for them. So when you heard Paul, it was as if you were there when Jesus was crucified. And the reason for which you went to the cross became bare to you. You would understand it and you would commit your life to it. And I said there were two dimensions to the cross. The provisions of the cross and the demands of the cross. It will be impossible to experience the provisions of the cross unless you have subscribed sufficiently to the demands of the cross. It is a cardinal emphasis of apostolic teaching. So Paul narrated everything that Jesus did and the potentials of everything that Jesus did in the Gospel of Romans. And from Romans chapter 1 to chapter 8, Paul revealed what Jesus did for the whole world. In order to bring the world into the full heritage of everything God has provided. And in Romans chapter 9 to Romans chapter 11, he referred particularly to the Jews. Showing them every potential possibility they have in God on account of the finished works of Jesus. But when he went to chapter 12, he said, Therefore, dearly beloved, 
Therefore means what I want to share with you from now on depends on what I have shared before now. He said, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Do not conform to this world or be a transformed by the renewal of your mind. So Paul said, separation from the world and commitment of life to God is what becomes the basis of demonstrating what God has given to us. Because in chapter in verse 3 of that scripture, he said, then you will be able to show. The word show is not the same as you know. It's possible to study. He said to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13 to 18. He said, until I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. He said, do not undermine the gifts that have been given to you by the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. So it is possible to know by reading. He says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a watchman that need not be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. So you can read and study and have an accurate understanding of specific emphasis in the kingdom. But that you know does not mean you have the ability to demonstrate. Because when it comes to demonstrating spiritual realities, there is an urgent need for fraternity with the spirit that hosts that reality. Because it is the working of that spirit in your life that translates to demonstration. So the word no is the word I do become aware. He said, whoever is in Christ Jesus is a new creation. All things are passed away. He said, behold. That means become aware that all things have become new. The word is I do But through study, through revelation, through exhortation and doctrine, you can become aware. But it doesn't mean you have the ability to demonstrate. Paul said the only time the ability to demonstrate is given to a man is when that man comes to fraternity by paying the sacrifice of alignment. So he said, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Do not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. He said, then you will be able to show. The word show is the word dokimasu. It means having the ability to demonstrate what you have. So on the strength of the cross, everything God has for humankind is already deposited in our spirit. But the frustration of humanity is the inability to demonstrate what we carry in our spirit. So a man knows he is the righteousness of God, but he can't understand why he's a slave of masturbation. He knows he's the righteousness of God, he can't understand why he's a slave of immorality. He knows he's the righteousness of God, but he is controlled and powered by secret sins. He can even come to a church where through commitment and zeal for the Lord, he is made a leader in the church, but in his heart, he knows he's a slave. Every time he washes, people shout, jump and cry. When he goes home, he loses his, his, his time. Because he knows what he's saying, he doesn't have the ability to demonstrate it. And I told us that spirits are not interested in what we know. Spirits are interested in the economy of life that is at work on our inside. Because the life at work in our inside is manifested as spiritual energy. That energy is what changes our world. So Jesus says to be witnesses. He didn't say to be teachers. He didn't say to be preachers. He said to be witnesses. So you have to first of all become a person of a reality before you can teach it. So we are witnesses before we are preachers, before we are teachers, before we are apostles, before we are prophets. The day we lose the ability to be witnesses, our preaching is vain, no matter how intelligent it sounds, because it will have no power to challenge the powers that be. So principalities come to contend with the quality of life you have, not the doctrine you preach. Jesus said that prince of this world come to him and find it nothing. He had not started preaching. The man knew that this is a witness. Because every time a witness speaks, the spirit of the utterance is communicated. So beyond teaching and education, he is communicating spirit. So Jesus said, the words that I preach, he said they are spirit, they are life. 
You may be educated listening to me, but beyond education, I am communicating the spirit to you because I am a witness. And in order to be able to demonstrate that dimension, Jesus committed his life perpetually to the will of God. So alignment becomes the hallmark of the Christian faith. Young believers will pursue after knowledge, all kinds of wisdom, in order to wow the audience. We are so zealous about showcasing our abilities. But when we grow on this ladder, we understand that obedience is more important. That's why you look at the fathers, they are calm. There was a time when they were zealous like you. But they now understand that it's not in the length of their teaching that men will be transformed. It's in the deposit of the spirit. So a man will choose to pray for 10 hours to come and share for 15 minutes. But a younger believer will choose to pray for 30 minutes to come and talk for 3 hours. Because he thinks it's a show. When you understand these things, your life will take new sets of priorities. So we say alignment is more important because without alignment, you may know what you have in God, but you will never demonstrate it. That is one of the greatest crises of humankind. We believe that God has not lied. We have faith in God, but we can't explain why our life seems to be beggarly. Our experiences seem to be epileptic. It's not a frustration to hear the scriptures affirm again and again. The worst part is that we come to church and the preacher keeps emphasizing what God has done for us. He will go as far as prophesying it. But every day we go home, we know we are in the middle of frustration. What we turn the situations around is when we make up our mind to come under the government of the Holy Spirit. Because of the dimensions of God that we carry is locked up in that spirit in our midst. And the demonstration of it is called the charisma of the Holy Ghost. What you call the gift of healing is the charisma of the Holy Spirit. What you call word of knowledge is the charisma of the Holy Spirit. The Bible said that gifts of the Spirit was the charisma of the Holy Spirit. So when you become pliable in the hands of God, then your life becomes a portion that the Holy Ghost demonstrates his dimension. So that time you think God is healing somebody, the Holy Ghost was actually giving expression to the flavor of healing that it is. So God wants our lives to become platforms upon which he can manifest his dimensions, theaters that reveals his essence. But that will not be possible if we still run by the power of flesh. So we said the cross is the judgment of God against flesh. So that the flesh will die and the glory of God can be revealed. And we said these are not things you do by zeal. Because zeal dies. The only thing that lives through you that is eternal is the spirit that dwells on your inside. So we said there are definite laws in the spirit that brings us to a place where we can allow God to flow through us naturally. So that the supernatural dimension becomes our natural disposition. It's not something we struggle and try to do. It's something we yield and manifest to us. And in order for this thing to become flawless, we said there are laws that we submit ourselves to. And these things flow through us. I was sharing with us yesterday how that it will be such a struggle to be able to lift a, a matter that weighs 80,000 kg. But that is the exact weight of the Boeing aircraft, the Airbus, weighing over 80,000 kg. It's impossible for that matter to float in the wind. So it will be a waste to struggle to carry it. It may fall and kill everybody. You can't even get a crane to lift it to that height. It's impossible. What makes a matter of such mass existing in a frame where law of gravitation is existing to float in the air like paper is a function of laws. It's called the law of aerodynamics. The moment that matter subjects itself to the law of aerodynamics, the potential of flight becomes natural. And the same way with every one of us, the moment we subscribe to the law of alignment, the flow of the life of God becomes natural. We struggle because we refuse to obey the laws of the spiritual. 
and it results in terrible catastrophes because we don't know the powers that causes these things to be. When the law of aerodynamics is distorted, you know that everybody on board they are already dead because you can't manage such a weight unless laws are in place. So we said Romans chapter eight verse one said, "There is now therefore no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit." But how do you walk after the spirit and not the flesh when you are made of flesh? We say it is the law of life that is in Christ Jesus. So it is subjection to law that makes it possible for a man to walk in the spirit. And we call it the law of spiritual life. So we listed those laws yesterday by the help of the Holy Ghost. And for those who are here, you saw that it was not something you do out of sin or out of, sin or out of flesh and abilities. It was more or less a subjection to the Holy Spirit to flow through your life. This morning I want to show us two things that constitute the blessings of the cross. I know we've been taught these things again and again and again. But I just want to touch two of them. To bring somebody another level of awareness. You know you eat the same food every day. If you want to grow, you will keep eating it. You can't come to the point where you say, I was eating rice since I was 10 years old. I won't eat rice again. I won't eat it anymore. If you stop eating food, growth will not just stop you with that. So even though we've heard this thing again and again and again, we will still hear it again. Hallelujah. You know, this is not sounds. So sometimes, it's not, we don't get to revival in nature. So that <laughs> people don't keep shouting everywhere, but they don't have principles to be bad. You know, in the church setting, we are taught principles and laws. When we go for the Bible meetings, we set people on fire. But you don't live by the fire you catch. How many of you want to get married and then you remember when you were saying under the anointing? And then on the strength of the same anointing, you now say, This is my husband. <laughs> when you want to get married, you will sit down and begin to remember everything you were told. That's why you remember that the man must be spiritual. You remember that the man must have the fear of God. You remember that the man must be submitted to spiritual authority. You, most times you didn't hear those things from the revival camp meetings. You heard them from the church. When the pastor was talking, I looked at him, it's not important. But when you want to make any decision in your life, those things that look not important, those are the things that will confine your decision making process. <laughs> So the fire keeps us burning, but the wisdom capsules are the things that determine the direction that we will go. And the value of our life is a function of the quality of decisions that we make. So this morning I want to show us two provisions that will bring us another heightened level of awareness on what Jesus has paid for and how to maximize it. And then we will pray applying it this morning. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You see, we've been taught. Basically, the four major provisions that we receive on account of the cross. One of it is healing. One of it is salvation. Salvation generally includes it. It's awful. Salvation of the spirit is deliverance from the messianic judgment. Salvation of the soul is deliverance from demonic powers. Salvation of the body is what you call healing. And salvation of your circumstances is what you call prosperity. Are we together? So these are four major food salvation that we've been taught over the years. Deliverance from messianic judgment, which brings us justification in the spirit. Deliverance from demonic powers, which brings salvation to the soul, and salvation from sin as transformation. And then deliverance from the body, which is healing. And then deliverance from circumstances, which is prosperity. Hallelujah. But I want to give us something more elaborate that will inform our operation with more confidence and audacity because if you are just taught salvation for the body as healing every time you want to approach it you are going to be looking for the principles that work and your lack of full understanding of those principles and how it works may constitute a deflection of the energy of your faith and then it will become a matter of struggle so i want to give us 
two broad umbrellas of what God has done that will encompass all of these four dimensions. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You see, one of the greatest crises of humankind from the beginning of creation was the inability to know who God was. A spirit being created the world out of nothing. And then he created the man and threw the man into the world. And he just began to relate to the man. The Bible said every morning in the cool of the day, the voice of the Lord came walking in the garden. So the man didn't understand what kind of species is this being. He didn't even as much as call it a name because he didn't know what this being was. So he only needed to follow the instructions of this being. So much so that a point came where the being gave him laws that indicted his existence. He said, The day you eat of this fruit, of this tree, he said, You will die, die. And the man didn't understand the implication of that contract because he didn't know the being that was talking to him. What do you mean, die? Who are you? You just want to give instructions, you just want to tell me what to do. And then obviously you are the one who created all this thing, but who are you? So he followed this being like that until he failed. And true to the words of this being, he died and he died. And then the human race continued like that. So a point came where the fathers discovered that of the truth, this being was suffering. And his words regulated and controlled the possibilities in the realm where they dwelt. So all they did was they will look at the being when it does something that is beyond their level, that is outside of the possibilities that they are used to. They now use a name to tie to that manifestation. So this being comes and somebody is sick and the being heals the person. They know that feeling is not something that humankind has the capacity to fulfill. But because this being has the ability to orchestrate the process of healing in the life of a human being, they now say this being is called healer. This being is called what? Healer. Now, on the strength of that name that they tie to that being, every time they suck healing, they will invoke that name. So those names became principles in which the presence of God were locked. And they carried it on their shoulders and handed it over from one generation to another. So the names in which they locked the dimensions of this being became the greatest heritage that they left for their children. So Abraham, for example, walked in lack and scarcity for a long time until he contacted this being and this being told him, just believe in me and I will give you an heir. And it took Abraham 25 years to understand that this being sustained the power to make fertile that which was dead. And the day he believed it and this being produced that dimension, he now said, this being is called El Shaddai. The meaning is that from the womb of this being, humankind have the liberty of being sustained of every form of infirmity that they have. So he handed over the name El Shaddai to his son Isaac as an eternal heritage. So when God came to speak to Moses, he said, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob knew me as El Shaddai. So the greatest heritage that Abraham handed over to his children was not the cactus that he had. It was what he caught in the spirit realm, locked in a name that he gave to his son. So every time the son walked with that name, even though the cactus were finished, even though the waters were dried up, so long as the son had that heritage called El Shaddai, he could dig wells in the dry land and water may come out. Because the El Shaddai meant having the ability to cause creation to produce. So when Abraham blessed his son, he didn't bless him with wine and corn, he blessed him with the name. This is the name by which I found this unseen reality, this being that is locked outside the borders of humankind. He has the ability to cause evil death to come back to life. But you remember, when Abraham wrote his PhD thesis, God tried him to, be, to know whether he understood the meaning of El Shaddai. And God came to him. After he waited for 25 years to receive Isaac, God now told him to go and kill Isaac. And he said, to kill your only child, just in case you think you have others, I'm reminding you that this is the only one you have. And then he added another thing that we recap pain in the heart of Abraham. He said, the one that you love. That was the greatest exam that humankind had to write in the days of Abraham because the posterity, the posterity of humankind rested on the seed of Abraham. So God wanted to know whether the confidence of Abraham was in this dimension of God that he has found 
or it was based on the things that they had to carry. If Abraham will understand the true scope and import of El Shaddai, then the powers of the El Shaddai will be really invested in that day. So he said to him, go and kill Isaac. And Abraham was wise enough not to tell Sarah because if he had told Sarah, Sarah would have migrated to Isaac. <laughs> so he carried the boy early in the morning and vanished. He said, we are going to worship God. What is worship? You want to go and kill your only child? <laughs> so we are going to worship. We are going to worship. That was the hardest example. You know, that's not kindergarten. You know, kindergarten faith is when you come and say, Lord, give me bread. And then bread shows up. You see your boy and they grow. Lord, give me car. And then somebody comes after three days and say, I was led to give you this car. Say, wow, oh God, we get power, we get power. <laughs> Jesus said, this commandment have I received of the Father, that I have the power to lay down my life and to take it up again. True power is when a man comes to a point where everything he has is willing to give it away because there is a confidence working on his inside that the God he knows is the one that suffices him of all things. That's a man who can walk into a desert and make it a forest. He doesn't cleave to the things that he has. He has a God that wherever he walks into, everything that was lacked will become a possibility because he carries something that is invisible on his inside. That man can give everything he has and go to a strange nation. He may go to heaven without money in his pocket. I heard stories of men like John Chilik. He was coming to Africa with his family and he had nothing. Even the money to pay for his ship fare, he had no dime. And then when he came, they killed him. And people were paying, receiving their receipts. And then he was going. They lied, it was 10 persons were left. And the guy was still going, oh God, you mad? People come there to present their ticket you don't have, and you are carrying a family of seven. Where are you walking to? It's a man that knows the El Shaddai. <laughs> when he walked, three persons to where they were collecting the ticket, somebody came and said he wasn't there to give this group. He doesn't know the man from anywhere. Because a man who has El Shaddai, even creation is sentenced to a law of supply for that man. The air that you breathe will become a sustenance. The water should be supported. Even the man will respond. That's why God said to the Isaac, stay put in Gela. Everybody was migrating to Egypt, but Isaac was he stayed in Gela. There was no hope, but he knew the El Shaddai. So the name of God is the greatest inheritance of the nation. And Abraham caught that name and he gave it to his son as an inheritance. Why do you think Isaac will sit down and tell Jacob, I bless you with corn and wine? They don't have regard to the laws of inflation anymore. You can live here and go to Mozambique. If a man that gives the El Shaddai say, I bless you with corn and wine, even the land of Mozambique will respond to you. This man knew the powers that shoot the foundations of the world. But he had to go through the test of alignment to enter into that scope and power of knowledge. I was trying to read the Bible to find out how Abraham answered this question. Because this question was the question that the immortal one himself gave to mankind. You know, when God wants to promote a man, he gives him an examination. The exam we write is not the revelation of human intelligence. Humankind studied the spirit realm and they fabricated everything we do from the realm of the spirit. The Bible said to Moses, he said, teach them laws, teach them ordinances, and teach them statutes. That is the foundation of human intelligence. Moses made available spiritual possibilities to the natural. So everything we do today as a lifestyle is a revelation of the things that Moses downloaded. That's why the laws of all the nations of the world were based on the laws of Moses. There's no promotion without an examination. And the kind of answer you write is what determines who you become. When I checked the script of Abraham, we discovered that Abraham wrote. He said he believed that God who gave him this child was able to raise him back to life in the field. So Abraham knew that the name El Shaddai means having the ability to cause life to come out of death. And when he wrote that question, he scored and made. <laughs> because Jesus wrote and he said, he said, men will come from the east, the west, the north, and the south to salute Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of God. These men, because of the way they passed their exams with God, even when they were on earth, they knew that they had a throne in heaven. How can Paul be walking on earth and say, I have run my race, I have finished my course? What is left for me now is a crown. What do you mean? 
when you are saying, Am I saved? Am I not saved? People are back at debate whether salvation is eternal or not. Somebody has left the realm of salvation. He doesn't just know who will be rewarded, he will tell, he's telling you the quality of his reward. Do you know the people that wear crowns in heaven? I don't think you have an idea. Ah, in the whole scripture, not even the seraphims of glory wear crowns. Not even the cherubims wear crowns. The only beings that wear crowns in heaven are the 24 elders that sit on 24 thrones. So Paul is telling you that in heaven I have a throne. <laughs> it's a no letter to enter when you pay prices. Because we come to a point where God will tell you that because you have rejected the world, I have become your shield and your experience the world. I am your reward. These were men that journeyed into parts that very few dare to wonder. He said, Paul and Barnabas. He said, These be the men that turned their walls upside down. The Bible says they went to disciples of Jesus. They said they turned the foundations of the nation upside down. You have not come to a point to make a sacrifice where you can move the hand of the heavens. Then you don't know the God that you talk about. You reign. Do you the meaning of father of many nations. Through what he entered, his name became bigger than the designation. Maybe the people that dwell in the walls of the Chaldees, they bear the name Abraham as a, a, a form of recognition and designation. But for Abraham, his name became a seed of authority in the heavens. So when the children of Israel cried for 430 years, God did not come down because they were crying. There was a name that had a stature that was superior to the voice of four million people. The cries of four million people was not as strong in the spirit as the name Abraham. So he said, because of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, am I come down? Names became signatures of authority in the realm of the spirit. Oh, people went to cast out devils and the sons of Sheba said, Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. Who are thou? Although you have names, but in the realm of the spirit, there's no authority on your name. So we understood another dimension of name that names are not actually meant to give you identity. Names are actually signatures of authority in the realm of the spirit. So when they saw the healer, they said, He is El Shaddai. When we saw, when they saw the refuge, they said, He is Jehovah Nisi. So every time you come under Jehovah Nisi, you don't need to pray, you are covered. The moment you understand the meaning of this, you are covered. And that was why, in the life of Jesus, you know he was Jehovah Adonai, he was Jehovah El Shaddai. All the names that God had was invested in one personality called Jesus. The Bible said in Colossians 2.9 that he pleased the Father, that the fullness of the Godhead should dwell in him body. But God wanted to promote mankind. To a place where we do not only need to go and find the meaning of El Shaddai and then we will be provided. Then when we need to win the war, we go and look for the meaning of Jehovah Allah. When we need children, we go, no, no, no. God wanted to give us a promotion so that through one name, every one of us, if we call it, every other thing will fall. So the strategy of the cross was to give you a name that is both El Shaddai, both Jehovah Nisi, both Jehovah Allah, both Jehovah Elohim, both Jehovah Tikkunu. The name of Jesus became an envelope that carried the fullness of the possibility of God. So the greatest gift that the cross made available to you is a name. My friend Victor, uh, three days ago, somebody hacked into his Facebook. And when the person hacked into his Facebook, he changed his password. And the moment the person changed his password, he began to send messages to people. And there's this business, if you do this business, you will get 50,000 in 45 minutes. So when he sent it, 
Everybody thought it was victory. Before we knew what was happening, somebody had said 50,000 already. Is that the power of a name? The moment they saw that message, the integrity of Victor all his life was invoked. So that message did not only carry the meaning that was written, that message carried the DNA and the signature of Victor. So the people that read that text, they were not trying to see whether this thing is logical. When they were reading that text, they were seeing the integrity of Victor. So even though he said, throw this money away, we will receive it after many days. They were not hearing the, the, the stability of the language. It was the integrity of who spoke that they were seeing. So in less than 30 minutes, people began to give money. The man had to run on Facebook and write a lot of disclaimers and say, this is not me. This is not me. Please stop. <laughs> it's the power of me. That's why we can throw our bread on water. Because when we hear, it is the answer time that we are seeing. It's not how logical it is. He said, give your all and after many days you will find it. You will, you will not be wanting, but what means you will find it? How is it possible? He said, call my name and every knee shall bow. You are not wondering, is it demons? Is it principality? He said, call my name. So the moment you hear it, you know that that name can the investment of the totality of the Godhead. But before Jesus came to the point where he gave that name to humankind, there was a price he needed to pay as a man. So the name Lord was not given to Jesus the Christ, it was given to Jesus the man. Because Jesus the Christ, the fullness of the Godhead was already in him. Jesus didn't need promotion, he's God. But he had to wear the garment of man. The Bible said he stripped himself. Philippians 2 verse 5 to 9. Of the garment of divinity. And he took the form of man. So he paid the sacrifice in the form of man. So the name that he has as the son of God, that name he can now share with mankind. So the greatest blessing of the cross is that you become the recipient of the name of Jesus. Every time you invoke it, every time you show up in the name of Jesus, even the whole elements of the spirit realm, they see Jesus, not you. It's the gift of the cross. That's why when we confront challenges, we come. All you need to do is to say, I come in the name of the Lord. Because it was paid for you to become the recipient of that name. It's one of the greatest gifts that man can have. The authority you have in the spirit realm is beyond your sacrifice. It is just based on the sacrifice of Jesus. But you need to be aware that you are now a bearer of the authority that is in that name. This is where you receive the gift that is beyond you. If all you know about the cross is that you have healing, because it was by his stripes you were healed, you will still be limited. But if you know that in the name of Jesus, everything about the cross was part of it, everything about God was part of it, when you carry that name, it is a cure to all of human affliction. I was praying for my sisters. One of them 32, one of them 34, two 32, not married, and these were beauty queens. You know when they were 24, 25, 26, those days was when Brazilian weed was ready. So they would buy weed 45,000. They are shoes there, my sister used to call it choker. The shoe had long heels, so when they wear it, they stand like this. And then they are walking with audacity. When you want to talk to them, if you, don't, if you are a young man and you don't know who you are, you won't approach them. You will be afraid of embarrassment. <laughs> because of elegance. Elegance! When they begin to the and to five, then they now discover that man is not a function of beauty, it's a function of favor. <laughs> <laughs> because all their friends who were ugly, who have no class, when they meet now, they are talking about husband and children. Ah, I need to go and feed my child. So when they come back from juicing with their friends, they come back crying. But those days when they come back, they are the star. All their friends talk about them. They hate them, they hate them, then they dash their money. Now those friends that look as if they were disadvantaged in life through favor, they now be home. And now they discover that their place was not in their father's house. They needed help. That was when they now invoke their brother. They go and I was going to church and they say, focus on your son is home. They didn't know that I was paying the price to become the custodian of the name. The cross, there was a name that gave me authority. 
not just in this world but in the world to come is the power that governs the age to come. I was pursuing after that day because I knew that one day all of them will depend on me, including my father. <laughs> because I am the hope of my father. So I knew if I fail, I have failed the generation. So when I was laboring in prayers and fasting, sometimes those days I fasted until if you see me, it's only my head. My neck was so long I was like this. They didn't know that I was fighting to enter into a spiritual economy. And when I apprehended the lady, that time they were 34 and 32. So they came to bed. They said they needed help. And the moment they recognized the grace, I said, I send you forth. <laughs> At this time, I have known that I have been priest over the family. It is the things I allow that can happen. But I was not told as a story. Sometimes in the place of prayer, the wall of my house will vanish. And then I will see myself standing in my father's compound. And God will show me the place of that in those compound. And then he will tell me, the power of this one is right. The power of this one is immorality. The power of this one is darkness. He never do these things. So I was learning from a syllabus that is superior to everything I studied in school. Meanwhile, I'm not encouraging anybody to leave his education because currently I'm doing my PhD. <laughs> I'm not talking down on education, but I'm telling you that in order to be relevant, you need to study from all the realms of God. There are three realms in this world, the supernatural realm, where the power and the government of God dwells. The preternatural realm, which is your foolish realm, where the angelic and the demonic operate, and then the natural realm, where your body and your five senses dwell. You need to learn from the three realms. If you only study from the foolish realm, you'll be limited. Because a professor in the foolish realm will be a, 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 a kidnapper in the face of a 10 year old who works in the witchcraft of the reason is not because the hair in the witchcraft will know so much. The realm which is studying from the superior to the natural realm. So as a professor, you may have hit the zenith in the soulish realm. But the girl that joined witchcraft for one week, she is studying from the higher realm. So that girl can touch the prof like this. And the prof will become paralyzed. Because what she has is a knowledge in the higher realm. So if you want to be relevant, you need to study from the three realms of God. I was studying from the realm of the spirit because I knew that one of the greatest benefits of redemption was the name of Jesus. And that name does not work when it's pronounced alone. It works as a government. I needed to know the things to do, the appetites to kill, the burdens to bear, in order for that name to answer through my voice. And when I gained some level of mastery, I began to control the possibilities of my family. One day my dad woke up and then the left part of his body was no longer working. And then they say it's partial paralysis. I saw they spring into my body. When they came to my body, they sat down. And then I walked around. I was speaking in tongues. They don't know the meaning of tongues. <laughs> they think it's a language, but I know it's a beast. I didn't know. God did not open my eyes to see what was the cause. And I knew it would be a waste of time to begin to research into the spirit to find out who shot this arrow, who shot this arrow. I knew what was happening around me was a mystery. So me too, I began to train on the economy of mysteries. So I spoke in tongues, I spoke in tongues, I spoke in tongues, I spoke in tongues, I spoke in tongues. After three days, I said, I said, they should take you back. When they took you back, you took strong. <laughs> we study in the realm where it matters the most. But there are many people who don't know the importance and the significance of a life. So they quote the things that Jesus has done. That's why you don't have experience. No man is special. Everybody is manifesting to the degree to which he submits to the law that makes things happen. You are mighty, you are your You reign, you ancient Then you continue again. Then after some time, God will not make you a disciple. 
Then the next time, the Holy Ghost will come and say, Don't fast six to six again. Fast six to three. So the Holy Ghost is teaching you how to resist that law of the demon. You don't have authority yet. So he's teaching you laws. So, so long as you follow it, or he will come and say, Pray in the night from 1 a.m. to 2 a.m. So if you are praying in the night from 1 a.m. to 2 a.m., that demon will have no power over you. You are a disciple. So your security and the possibilities of God that you experience is subject to the degree of your obedience to those laws. Then you will grow, you become a friend. Then after the Holy Ghost begin to teach you secrets. You know the are covered by secrets. You are turning from the state to a disciple, you are turning from the disciple to a friend. Jesus said you are no longer servants of your friends. Therefore, you need to do the secrets of the kingdom. So that time, if you notice, if a demon is coming, you will notice that kind of something must happen. Then you wake up that morning, you don't go out. You pray in tongues in twelve. Then you go. Even when that demon comes, you will move around, move around, there will be no place to touch. You will know secrets now. You want to go for interview. Then you wake up around my head. You will praise God from one to two. You did pray, you are just praising God. When you finish praising God, you will dance and throw on the floor. As you finish, you now carry your certificate. They say 10,000 people apply, then they'll come and pick your own like this. They think it's luck and chance. They didn't know that you were invoking the power secrets. And you are a friend. You want to go for interview. People ask you, they say, it's kept up, it's kept up. Then the Holy Ghost comes in the morning and asks you three questions. Who was the fifth president of Nigeria? Who was the second governor general of the oil industry? And then those three questions, you say you don't know. You now check on the internet. When you now went for the interview, Everybody failed, but when you came, the first person they asked you, they said, Who is the second president of Nigeria? And you asked Jesus. They said, Who is the second president of Nigeria? Oh, you are walking by secret now. That's when men become invisible. Jesus said, As a weed. As a weed, no way. Thou business that from whence it come to where it goes. He said, So are they that are born by the Spirit of God. You walk up that day. You wanted to wear a pink shirt because that's the clothes collected from the channel. Then the Holy Ghost came and said, Wear not your white and black shirt. This is not a doctrine, this is life. Meanwhile, the guy that came from the US that's looking for wife, God has told him that the lady that come around 12 with white and black is a wife. You didn't know. You didn't know why you left 10,000. You carried the money to wear to the top of the office. He said, Go back. Yeah, the white, I'm not dressed. Because that white or black dress, that day is not a your husband. It's a rare or secret. That's how you rule the world. And then when you graduate from the realm of secret, then God makes you a son. The son is a kingdom. He said the heir, the heir. We have become joint heirs of Christ because we are children of the kingdom. That's the second gift of the cross. The second gift of the cross is that you have become a part of the family of God. So God has become your father. God is no longer just your Lord. God is no longer just your disciple. God is no longer just your friend. God is now your father. So he has the responsibility of making this work for you. Hope you know for David to go to war, he needed to consult the union and the two men. And the Holy Ghost will tell him that when you see the mammary trees move, the means have come ahead. Go, oh, you will conquer. But Abraham did not need to consult the nations. He had traveled beyond secret. Now he's an heir. So he cannot say, Oh, take some and come, let him fight. Five kings and he wins them. Abraham throws a stone like this. He He's a son. Go and be sent down obligation to provide for him because God is Father. I told us yesterday that the meaning of Father in Hebrew is true. He is the foundation. God becomes the stability. The meaning of father in the Greek is partner. It means sustainer and nourisher. When God becomes your father, it's not his responsibility to provide for you. So even the days you make this day, God will cover you up. Mercy becomes an economy that works for you. Second thing is that we're not part of the status of training and the full term of the service. That's why every morning we wake up, the Bible said the message of God and we you every morning. Because you know that songs may be mistake. But because they are sons, there is a divine calculation that makes for the advantage, even when they are. It's a privilege that we have because of the cross. And it's on the strength of our sonship that we have authority to make things we do. Because we know we have the backing of Zion. These are provisions that we have in the cross. That's why when we wake up, we say, 
He helps Satan. Comes to announce me. And on my birthday, which is first of March, he said, cut six of your clip and put it on Telegram. It was something. People were troubling him. Say, where is this guy's message? When I received the talk, I now say, okay, something take. And something released those six clips from Telegram on the eleventh of March. That was ten days after the clips were released. I received call from seventeen nations of the world. <laughs> from my country. How can you be here? On the 14th of March, 13 days after that action, I received four invitations from the United States of America. <laughs> Someone came, he said, what's the name of your ministry? We want to open a branch, we want to open a head office so that we can have workers working here to coordinate your invitation in the U.S. Do you know how many years it takes to receive invitation outside the borders of your habitation? But the hell that I came, he said, I will begin to announce it. In remnant, we have raised the dead. A remnant we have seen bones, men there. This is not Apostle Roman's testimonies. Those of us who are on ground, we see all kinds of healing, but nobody knew us on the answer that I came. He said, I want to begin to announce it. So if I give a charge of five minutes, the angels come and they blow the sofa. <laughs> so people hear, they don't hear my voice, they hear the voice of God. That's why John went into the wilderness until the day of the soul God. And when John came out, he didn't know the Bible. All he knew to do was to cry. And when John cried, the Bible said, The whole of Judea, when it is the cry of an island, you don't know what to cry. Oh, until God speaks, things will change. For the past three months, we can't rest. We have meetings from Tuesday to Sunday. Tuesday to Sunday. Between the last two weeks, you know, we have spoken in five universities with nothing less than 2,500 attendants. People come, they say, we've heard your messages. Oh, thank you for being a blessing to the body of Christ. I say, me? Who taught the body of Christ? Oh, what, what are you talking about? In less than six months, we are in nations. They say they want to bring me to bring you here. How is it happening? Because you have become a part of that family. Your alignment quota is complete, then it gives you your inheritance. Wow. And then in a nation, you will be there. You be inside here, you think it's all about Selman. You don't know what God is doing. These men are called by ordination to be catalyst of revival. The people who include the revival, they are not even emerged. Because the revival is a spirit of righteousness and signs and wonders. Some of you that come for colonial, you are not known. The day of your rising, you will say, you will come and kneel down before Selman and say, Thank God, you are the one that made me there. You say, Me, I don't be aware. He will be shocked. That somebody like this who has no name was part of your union. You will rise, you will enter the territories, and the dead will rise on their own. And the world will see a man of wonder have risen because your own quota of alignment have been fulfilled. People who went to the same Bible school with Katekum and they said they didn't remember her because she was so quiet and free. You can't imagine that any spiritual possibility can break out of this one. But when the alignment quota was completed, she rose up as the brightest revelation of the hidden dimension of God. They may say, my woman, hey, no, hey, women don't have a voice in the north. They are joking. They are joking. They are joking. People from Akosuaru and now from the United Kingdom. They say, who is this for? Who is this? They say, my son. Alignment. You are a member of the glory of God. The first time I heard my message, I said, Kai, I need to go back and work on my intonation because I was talking like an Indoma man. I didn't hear my message. They said my message is going. I said I will not hear. Because when I heard it, I was so disappointed at the quality of English. How can I be talking like this? I said, no, I want to add some phonetics, I have some coordination. But every time I tried to compose myself, the life that flowed to the message was choked. So I knew that for me, it was a voice of a man. Witness, crying because God came as a father. He said, This is your inheritance. A day will come when some of your hand will not become the hand of God, the hand of God. So when you come for meeting, you can be playing and laughing. But when you lift your hand like the scriptures will begin to rise, then you will say there is a man that carries the hand of God. We do not read about Moses. He ran out of Israel, he was in the wilderness for 40 years. What was he doing? Attending to sheep. But when God visited him, the rod that he had all these years that was meant for eating sheep, he didn't know that that was the rod of God. And the point came, that same rod, he will point it to the Red Sea, and the Red Sea will part. That same rod, an army will come to fight Israel, so long as he holds that rod like this, that rod became the banner of God over Israel. 
what you carry is enough. The problem is that the whole power of alignment has not been achieved. When God begins to announce you, you will say, Is this in me? You will be shocked because it will be bigger than your imagination. He said, God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all you can think or imagine. It's the workings of God. You reign. You reign. now he knows him no more. So he saw what they were doing. When Paul's encounter came, he became greater than all the apostles. But will you be willing like Paul to say, Lord, what will you have me do? There was a chance that that day is yesterday. I want us to pray now. I want us to pray now. We will pray for the next 10 minutes. And then I will pray for some people. Then we'll be out of your presence. Who can help us with that chat now?
my spirit that most of us here are young people. I want to pray for a few persons that are desperate to the use of God for what God wants to do now in this season. We are part of those people who come out with us. Desperate, desperate. Listen, what God wants to do, you have not seen it. I tell you the truth. I've seen glimpses, glimpses in visions. You've not seen it. In the name of Jesus, in the 
I hope you enjoyed this video and I believe that you were blessed. If um, you were blessed by this video, make sure that you click on the share button and share it to a friend. And also make sure that you like the video so that YouTube can recommend this video to other people so that they can also be blessed by the message. If you have any question, please make sure that you contact us and we'll get back to you. And also if you are watching this video and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior, I want you to make that decision. Just contact us in the description. Call us and let us lead you to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. And lastly, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and turn on the, that notification bell icon. Turn it on so that when new videos are uploaded, you can be notified. Thank you so much and see you in our next video and prayer section. Bye.